If uh, people could take their seats, we're going to get going in about 2.5 minutes. All right, uh, we're going to get going. Um, I want to welcome you all to uh, Victoria, BC. I think uh, six years ago we were in this same uh, facility, actually, and um, and uh, it's a very nice facility, a hotel, and a beautiful location. I uh, hope everyone's finding it uh, comfortable and uh, easy to get around. Um, so today uh, we're going to start off uh, with uh, some uh, agenda items about first off accepting the agenda and uh, and seeing if there's any changes to the agenda or schedule um, and then we're going to get into some updates on actions arising from last year's an annual meeting the 94th which dave wilson will go over and then we do have a series of presentations on uh, getting an update on the status of the of the uh, fishery from uh, 2018 and then stock status and also the set line survey and et cetera, which will take us uh, all the way through the afternoon uh, and uh, maybe as late as five o'clock. We'll see how this all unfolds over the next while. But um, before getting into the agenda, I just um, wanted to provide a, a couple of uh, uh, comments as well. Um, both Canada and the U.S. have had a long-standing and pr productive relationship that uh, has been going on for almost 100 years with the International Pacific Halibut Commission. And while we do have a, a temporary impasse on uh, levels of harvest within Canada, we are confident that our productive relationship will continue for many more years into the future. <clears throat> and you may recall since uh, the annual meeting uh, of Last year, last year in 2018, the commissioners have met uh, by in person and by teleconference uh, eight times, I think it is, to resolve our differences and, and see how we could set uh, harvest level within Canada. Both parties have shared proposals and we have explored methods to set harvest levels, uh, for example, set amounts, uh, poundage, a percentage of the TCY. We have also uh, explored um, other aspects of the fishery at the same time. Um, we've asked um, the commission to provide us additional information, which they've been very helpful in doing over the, uh, the course of uh, almost a year. Um, there's a couple of those papers that we would propose to share with you. Um, uh, and so we'll <coughs> be asking Dave to post those on the website uh, sometime later today. But, um, 
Well, we have not made any agreement, and this is important prior to this meeting. We also wish to hear from you um, through the conference board and PEG on your views. Um, and so over this course of the this week, um, we expect that you will provide um, respective commissioners uh, and various meetings that are gonna occur um, over the next three, uh, four days um, on your thoughts, which will help inform the commissioners to um, make a, a decision on how best to move forward. So with that, uh, Chris, I would stop and uh, turn it over to you if there's anything else that you wish to say about this as well. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chairman. And <clears throat> just very briefly, first of all, it's great to be back in the beautiful city of Victoria and the lovely Empress Hotel and the opportunity to get to see so many of my friends and colleagues from Alaska and the Pacific Northwest as, as well as Canada. So um, I'm already enjoying the week for that, for that alone. To your point about the meetings that we've had between the US and Canadian commissioners that began, I guess, last April following um, the annual meeting where we were unable to reach agreement. And I, as well as uh, Mr. Yamada, began participating in those, I believe it was in November. And I, I did so with a, a, a little bit of unease because I know there's some unease amongst our constituents about the prospect of us coming to some agreements outside the meeting process. I was always viewed these meetings uh, not as coming to an agreement prior to the meeting. I think, as you point out, we need to hear from our constituents, from our PAG, from our conference board, from the staff on the latest assessment results and apportionment results. And I saw this as an opportunity for us to exchange ideas, to explain to each other our perspectives, to pose some potential uh, compromises, some solutions that would allow us to uh, much be in a much better position at this meeting after we hear those reports and hear from the constituents put us in a much better position to hopefully come to an agreement this year, uh, both on our overall harvest approach, as well, of course, as the apportionments therein. And I believe that we've had some very good, very productive discussions, and it has put us in a better position to do that this week. So I very much appreciate uh, the spirit and the productivity of those meetings, and I look forward to the rest of the week. Thanks. Thank you very much, Chris. Um, just before getting into the agenda, I do want to make note of some uh, 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 notable guests that are in attendance in the meeting. Joan Suck Park is the deputy director of the NPAFC, is in attendance in the meeting today. Uh, we also have a number of former commissioners uh, uh, as well. Uh, Jeff Kaufman, David Boyce, Don Lane, uh, Linda Benken, uh, Philip Lestikoff and Jim Balsinger and um, Gary Williamson. So all uh, welcome um, and uh, look forward to having further conversations with you that um, uh, and hear your views on uh, how things are going within the IPHC and uh, given your uh, wealth of experience uh, over the course of uh, many years of working with uh, commissioners and with IPHC staff. So welcome to the meeting, and um, I'm now going to turn over to um, the executive director, David Wilson, who, um, I guess, David, first off, we need to adopt the ag agenda. So I, I'm just going to ask, is there any changes to the agenda that uh, people would like to see? So David, I'm not seeing any from any of the commissioners, and so I'm now going to turn this over to you um, for the next uh, couple of agenda items. Thank you, Chair. So we just wanted to cover a few logistical arrangements for the meeting. Uh, so first of all, first of all welcome. Um, if I could have the uh, meeting page projected onto the screen, please. Um, I just wanted to remind all participants uh, of the new IPHC website and the accessibility for all of the meeting material uh, and, and some of the other elements uh, for, this, for this meeting. Um, so on the webpage, which is currently projected on the screen, if you haven't already been there, the 95th session of the IPHC annual meeting. Uh, if you scroll down, you will see all of the meeting documents posted both individually and where there's a PowerPoint presentation. It's also provided 
But more importantly, and probably easier for you, is the very first document at the top of the list, which is, uh, has a numbering of 00. zero. And this is the complete collection of all documents which are being put forward to the Commission for consideration and potential decision at this meeting. Uh, essentially, it's a, an extended version of what used to be called the Blue Book. Um, that was something that was requested from a number of stakeholders, and so we've ensured that all documents that will be considered at this meeting are available, and the list of documents in that, uh, that file is fully linked, and which will enable you to navigate between any and all of the documents. There was also a request from the conference board and the processor advisory board to provide uh, greater uh, numbers of, um, I guess, versions of the what was formerly known as the catch tables. And so we have developed, uh, primarily by uh, Dr. Stewart, the mortality projection tool, um, which is also available at the link on the screen. I think it's the fifth bullet point there you can see. And Dr. Stewart will go through that tool later this morning so you fully understand it. Uh, and that replaces that uh, previous pr provision of a few individual uh, tables of, of catch, catch limits, which we're now uh, calling the, the mortality projections. Um, then I also wanted to indicate or just remind everybody that we do have the IPHC function tomorrow night starting at uh, 7 p.m. to 9.30 p.m. Um, we'll remind you tomorrow of the exact location rather than um, filling your, your head up with uh, additional meeting rooms as you're going to have to move around quite a bit over the coming days. So just lock it off in your calendar if you haven't already done so. Uh, the IPHC function, uh, 7 p.m. to 9.30 p.m. tomorrow evening. Uh, at this point, Chair, I would like to pass to the Assistant Director who's going to go through some of the other uh, administrative arrangements for the meeting. Thank you. Go ahead, Steve. Uh, thank you, Dr. Wilson. For those of you here in the room, the Secretariat staff is here to help you, and they are at the back table in the back of the room there. And at any point during the meeting, feels, please feel free to contact any of us for, for assistance. Um, when it comes time to comment, we'll ask the people to making public comment to come to this microphone that's up at the front of the ta uh, front table here, and we'd ask you to sign up to comment back there with the secretary at staff. There's a place where you can sign up. Mike is waving his hand, and that's where you can sign up. And we will take public comment when the commission uh, is ready to take it, and it will include not only the audience here in the room but the webinar audience online as well, and we'll, we'll contribute their comments and questions. So please sign up if you want to make a comment at the back of the room, and when it comes time, we'll call you up, and this is the place to make that comment right up here in front. Uh, those of you on the webinar have already discovered the webinar. Those of you in the room, if you need the webinar when you're not uh, here in the room, you can sign up right on the, on the AMO95 webpage, and you can follow along there. The other thing that the webinar allows us to do is to record the meeting. And so shortly after the meeting, uh, the recordings of the sessions will also be posted for your reference at the meeting page on the website. Again, the Secretariat staff is here to assist you. Please let us know how we can help you. Thanks, Steve. Okay, so we'll now move on to the next item uh, in the agenda, agenda item three, and this is also um, dealt with through paper 03 uh, on, on the website. And this is an update on the ac actions arising from the 94th session of the IPHC annual meeting and the subsequent 94th session of the interim meeting. And so the intention here is simply to provide the Commission with an opportunity to consider uh, the various aspects of progress which the Secretariat has been able to make uh, in conjunction with, this, with its subsidiary bodies uh, in relation to the direct requests for action by the Commission during those two sessions. Now contained within this document, uh, primarily as attachment Appendix A rather, are all of those requests or, and recommendations made by the Commission at those two meetings. Uh, it's not my intention to walk through each of those in detail. They are relatively um, straightforward. If we could have that appendix up on the screen, and I'll just walk through what's on there. Uh, so, so the way this is uh, formatted is uh, you have the meeting at the top, you have the recommendation and requests that are listed associated with the recommendation or request number on the far left. 
the specific wording from the Commission in terms of the action that was requested to be undertaken, uh, and then we've provided a very simple update uh, and where a more detailed update has, is required, we've referenced the specific document where that information can be found. Um, and we've color coded them all in terms of whether they're completed in progress or uh, pending. Uh, and I'm pleased to indicate that uh, all of them have been completed with uh, one also in progress in terms of, of additional elements, and that being the continued advancement of the IPHC website and the sharing of information. Um, there are two, if we scroll down, they are interim meeting requests 03 and 04, which were uh, resulting from obviously the interim meeting and requests for action from the North Pacific Fisheries Management Council to provide uh, additional feedback both on the uh, regional observer scheme and then also on the A80 to deck sorting EFP, which is currently underway. Uh, and you can see where they're currently shown as expected. And I can indicate that uh, agency report 12 does deal with that first request. And request number four, which is to do with the EFP, uh, that's also been articulated in information paper 05, which was provided by those undertaking that deck sorting uh, EFP. Uh, and there will be a short presentation uh, from the authors of that uh, EFP um, later in the meeting, I think tomorrow, tomorrow afternoon. Uh, and so with that, Chair, I'd, I'd like to close on that particular item unless there are any specific questions for further updates or clarifications. Thanks, Chair. Yeah, thanks, Dave. <clears throat> I don't see any uh, questions for you on that. Just confirm that. No. Thank you, Chair. So then we'll move to the next agenda item, agenda item four, which is the report of the Secretariat. Uh, and so just, just a, a, a reminder, uh, that's the wrong document. So we're after the report of the Secretariat. Um, this is a summary of some of the key items which the Secretariat would like to report out upon which are not included in the other documents put before you. So most of the work that the Secretariat has undertaken over the last year is contained in the various meeting documents, uh, but there are another up, a number of other additional items that we'd simply like to highlight, and this is all shown in paper 04. In terms of some of the staffing changes and improvements that have been made throughout 2019, we had uh, two new full-time arrivals. Uh, Carolyn Robinson is the new fisheries data coordinator or fisheries data specialist. Uh, and we also recently hired uh, Colin Jones as the new fishery uh, independent set line survey specialist to deal specifically with gear and bait issues. That was not a Freudian slip. Um, in terms of full-time changes, we have uh, Ed Henry, who's out at, currently outside uh, at the registration table, and he moved from that previous uh, survey specialist or survey coordinator position into the new fisheries data specialist, focusing on bycatch data. We also had Lara Erickson, I think you're all very familiar with, who moved from her old position as fisheries uh, data manager and is now the branch manager for fisheries statistics and services, and she'll be presenting the fisheries statistics update to you all shortly. And Huen Tran, who moved from a fisheries data specialist position into the fisheries data manager, which was Lara's previous position. So a lot of uh, internal movement uh, and with the two new full-time hires um, to, to compensate. We also have a number of temporary positions which uh, came online in 2018. Um, there are four contracted positions. Uh, Anna Simeon, who is now our laboratory technician, who works with uh, Dr. Planus um, in the biological and ecosystem sciences branch. Um, we have Dr. Stephen Barukov and Pierre Akapi, both who are hired on two year contracts to help accelerate and advance the management strategy evaluation pro um, process. Uh, Dr. Barukov is uh, working as a programmer and Dr. Carpi will be joining us on the 1st of April uh, to assist uh, Dr. Hicks uh, specifically with the MSE research. In addition there, squeezed in, we have uh, Susan Dodds, who we came on board as our 
um, annual intern, undergraduate intern, and we will uh, also be looking to fill the next intern position very shortly for 2019. Uh, I'd also like to take a moment, uh, we did announce this at the interim meeting, but uh, again to congratulate Kai Dahl of Petersburg, Alaska, who was the recipient of the 2018 IPHC Merit Scholarship, uh, and she began her studies in fall of 2018 at Greenville College. Um, this is uh, an ongoing scholarship, and we currently have two others who are uh, receiving it for the duration of their studies, um, and so just a reminder that Shaley Dahl, another Dahl, who received uh, the scholarship in 2015 and hers uh, is completed in 2019. And then also, and forgive my pronunciation, Isabel Echavrio, of course, Echavrio, uh, received in 2016 and, and, and is running for another two years as part of that scholarship program. This is something that we're very uh, proud to be able to offer and we'll be undertaking this uh, scholarship program renewal every two years. And so next year we'll be looking to issue uh, another scholarship recipient. The IPAC meetings and subsidiary bodies, uh, we had a, a successful year of uh, all of our meetings being held throughout 2018. I don't think I need to go into any particular detail, primarily because you're going to hear and receive the reports of each of those bodies throughout the, the next few days. So, uh, the chairs and vice chairs of those bodies will be presenting them to you. Uh, at this point, I'll pass to the assistant director to run through some of the fishery regulation outcomes. Thanks, Steve. Uh, thank you, Dr. Wilson. So there's just a few slides here uh, reminding everyone what regulations were adopted at the last annual meeting. And they customary ones about fishing periods or minor amendments. This is the... There we go down. A few other minor changes, mostly that had to do with the, the charter management measures. We'll just go right through those. And then uh, we'll note that there were a number of regulatory proposals from the last annual meeting that uh, were deferred by the commission to a working party of the secretariat with the relevant uh, contracting party agencies to look at further to see if solutions uh, might be possible. And these all centered on the enforcement of uh, bag and limit possession regulations for the recreational fishery for those who live aboard their vessels. So we did meet as a working group during the course of the year. Uh, we're not able to come up with any new solutions to change the regulations as they are now, certainly open to further discussion and uh, are always looking for this. This is a, a these, these issues have come up in the past and I suspect they will continue to come up because it, it means it's important for a, a number of stakeholders. And uh, so for the action that you assigned us at the last annual meeting, we did meet, we did not come up with any new solutions, but we are certainly open to uh, more possibilities. And moving on to our interactions with the contracting party agencies, with Fisheries and Oceans Canada, uh, much of our Interaction this year centered on the expansion of the fishery independence at line survey in area 2B. We did, we did regulatory areas 2B and 2C this year and in 2B that required a lot of coordination, mostly uh, having to do with areas and species of uh, concern. And you'll hear more about that when we discuss the uh, fishery independence at line survey in a later presentation. And we have participated throughout the year with the Halibut Advisory Board. Uh, south of the border here, we have worked with uh, NOAA Fisheries in, in several different ways. The, with the Alaska Fisheries Science Center, we have spent uh, much of this year and the previous year on permitting for research having to do with the requirements of the Marine Mammal Protection Act. For any of you who are involved with that, you know it is a complex undertaking and uh, we appreciate the help and assistance that we've gotten from the Alaska Fisheries Science Center to allow our research to be permitted along with theirs to meet the requirements of the Marine Mammal Protection Act. With the North Pacific Fishery Management Council, our interactions this year have centered on uh, the abundance-based management of Pacific halibut bycatch initiative that the council has undertaken. ABM is a working group that they've established that we participate in. 
and have contributed to over the course of the year, and you'll hear more about that from the North Pacific Fishery Management Council. And also, uh, during the course of the year, the North Pacific Council worked on regulation changes allowing Pacific halibut retention in pots in the Bering Sea, and we contributed to the documentation for that. Uh, down in Regulatory Area 2A with the Pacific Fishery Management Council, uh, we worked with them on the annual changes to the catch sharing plan that they maintain for Regulatory Area 2A. And we have spent a lot of time with the council and the council's advisory bodies uh, on management of the non-tribal directed commercial fishery in Regulatory Area 2A. We began the conversation during 2017 and it continued during 2018 on, on the management of that fishery this year in 2018, focusing in particular on our regulatory proposal from the Secretariat to uh, change the length of the fishing period in that fishery, about which you'll hear more uh, tomorrow morning when we talk about regulatory proposals. And with that, I'll turn it back over to the Executive Director. Thanks, Steve. Um, what, what I'd like to do now is just highlight some of the communication and outreach improvements that we've made throughout 2018. And our intention here is, uh, first of all, for those who are, who are not familiar with them, to become familiar with them, and then also to seek your um, an initial review and, and feedback over this, this coming five days. And so please feel free at any point in time to pull up any of the Secretariat staff and, and provide some feedback on the utility of these additional tools. Uh, and in particular, suggestions for further improvement, uh, which would be greatly appreciated. So the IPHC website, uh, which, which I've already shown for the annual meeting page, uh, was launched in December 2017. Uh, in 2018, we have added four additional elements or improved substantially upon these various elements. Uh, and first of all, it's the uh, fishery independent set line survey data, which includes the CPUE biological data, uh, and you can also look at the FIS performance and all species number per unit effort. Uh, and I'll, I'll open that up in just a moment. In addition, the regulations portal. Um, most of you would not have used that this year, given that we had only two regulation uh, proposals submitted from stakeholders. But we'll touch on that in, in just a short moment. The landings data, you should have all been receiving uh, fisheries landings data throughout the second half of 2018 on a twice monthly basis. Uh, and that web page uh, is updated on the 1st and 15th of, of the month of every month. Uh, and then also the mortality projection tool, which I touched on earlier and which Dr. Stewart will, will uh, touch on. First of all is the fishery independent set line survey data interactive. And this is going to be presented to you in greater detail by um, Eric Soderlin informally outside the room uh, at the couple of laptops that we have available. He'll arrive uh, I believe it's this evening or tomorrow morning, and so he'll be around for a day and a half or so to run you through the Fishery Independent Survey Interactive. Uh, you should all be familiar with this by now. If you haven't, please do um, sign up for a, a, a mini demo from Eric. He's uh, been the brainchild behind the development of this portal. Uh, and for those who are unfamiliar with it, a quick summary is that it contains all of the information from the Fishery Independent Survey, the raw, raw vetted data, um, throughout the history of the survey. And you can scrutinize that data through this portal down to individual survey sites um, throughout the entire range of the fishery independent survey. Uh, and uh, as I said, he will be available to walk you through that uh, over the next couple of days. Fishery regulations, we have set up the portal for submitting uh, proposals to the interim meeting and the annual meeting. Uh, it's a relatively simple uh, online portal for you to upload your proposals for, for regulation changes. Um, noting that it's closed for this meeting, we will continue to uh, update you and remind you throughout the course of 2019 in preparation for the next interim and annual meetings. Finally, I'd also like to uh, highlight some of the changes that we've made in terms of the written material that we produce. The annual meeting report, and this is not of, sorry, the annual report. This is not the annual meeting report, which emanates from this meeting. It's the annual glossy uh, publication that we provide. Um, that was some year and a half to two years out of date by the time it was published. 
Uh, we have now moved to a schedule where we expect that that will be uh, in printed format and in your mailboxes uh, within the next two weeks for 2018, thereby providing you not only a, a very good uh, summary of 2018 activities, but also it will highlight the, the key outcomes from this meeting uh, as one of the chapters. And so that will be published uh, hopefully by the middle of February, um, touch wood by the end of February. In terms of the report of assessment and research activities, uh, we have continued to change the way and improve the way we present uh, research information to you. Uh, and I would remind you that we have moved to uh, an abbreviated format of the RARA, uh, which is currently provided as a, essentially a, an interactive index as paper information 04. And if you were to open that paper, it's available on the meeting page. It has a fully interactive um, table of contents which leads you to all of the relevant information either as meeting documents to this meeting or as new web pages uh, on the IPHC website that contains the latest research information and summaries related to that topic. And the reason that we've made this change is that much of the information in the previous RARA was already outdated by the time it went to print. This way we're able to provide you with uh, up-to-date results and uh, scientific proposals and research that's ongoing on the website. And so I do encourage you to open that document, look at that uh, interactive page and follow the links to the information that you're uh, most interested in. If you find that it's still deficient, please do come and talk to us and we'll work to improve it, make further improvements to it. And that's all I have in terms of additional items other than those papers that are put before you for this meeting. Thank you, Chair. Thanks very much, Dave and, uh, and Steve, for that presentation. Um, I would like to offer my uh, congratulations to you and your staff on the update to the website. Um, as you said, I think it started back in 2017 and has carried on through 2018. And the intent is to improve the uh, transparency, but you know, to provide you the information so you're informed about what is happening within the International Pacific Halibut Commission world. Um, and so in addition to um, the website that you spoke about and the different pieces around the set line survey, the, the regulation portal, the landing data, the mortality projection tool, um, there's also the piece, as you spoke just now on, around the communication and outreach. Um, so those are changes to how uh, information is disseminated. And as Dave said, I want to hear feedback from you about what you would like to see as far as changes or improvements um, to um, the website and or communication and outreach. So um, if you... You can provide that uh, feedback in a number of ways uh, during the course of this week directly to um, uh, Dave and Steve and uh, IPHC staff, to us as commissioners, um, and also during the public comment period. So encourage you to look at the website and, um, and the amount of uh, material that is available to you in a, I, I think, in a very transparent matter, uh, manner. You may have things you would like to see added or changed, so we would like to know. Um, so I think with that, Dave, unless there's anything else on these other items, I think we're going to see if the commissioners have any other comments they want on these particular pieces. Not seeing any, Dave. Then uh, we're going to move on to uh, a report from uh, Lara Erickson on the uh, fishery statistics. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, I will present the 2018 fishery statistics. It's paper five, agenda item number five. 
of the 95th um, IPHC annual meeting, which can also be found on our website. So as an overview, please keep in mind that these numbers presented here are preliminary estimates. All values are in net weight and account for the full calendar year. The 2018 total mortality of Pacific halibut is estimated to be 17,590 tons. And then looking at the total Pacific halibut mortality by fishery type, the commercial fishery accounts for the largest portion at 61% followed by the recreational fishery at 19% and the bycatch and other fisheries at 16%. Comparing these estimates to 2017 removals, the total is roughly 2,000 tons less with bycatch mortality in other fisheries accounting for a larger portion at 16% than it was in, uh, or in 2018. So remove, or reviewing removals by fishery type, the commercial fishery in Canada ran from March 24th uh, through November 7th, with 100% of the fishery limit being landed at 2,401 tons. And in the United States of America, the West Coast fisheries are comprised of the Treaty Indian, non-treaty directed, and two incidental fisheries. The Treaty Indian commercial fishery was 4% over the fishery limit at 183 tons, following two unrestricted fisheries and one restric restricted fishery. The directed commercial fishery was 1% over the fishery limit at 92 tons after three 10 hour fishing periods. So it's shut. Um, so the incidental commercial landings within the salmon troll fishery, again on the west coast, was 2% under the fishery limit at 16 tons. And the incidental commercial landings within the sable fish fishery was 13% under the fishery limit at 20 tons. So moving on to the quota share fishery in the United States of America and Alaska. Um, it ran from March 24th to November 7th, with 95% of the fishery being landed at 7,571 tons. The Annette Island Reserve fisheries take place in IPHC Regulatory Area 2C, and 14 tons of Pacific halibut were landed during 14 two-day openings between March 23rd and September 30th. And now moving on to the recreational fisheries. In Canada, the allowed maximum length of Pacific halibut was reduced to 115 centimeters. The landings were 14% under the allocation at 364 tons. Separately within the experimental recreational quota, 7.6 tons were landed in 2018. So in the United States of America on the West Coast, the recreational fisheries within the three states saw landings of 211 tons or at 4% under the allocation. And in the United States of America in Alaska, the charter sector within the recreational fishery saw a reduced minimum size in the reverse slot limit at 38 inches in IPHC regulatory area 2C with the landed catch at 331 tons and 10% under the allocation. Additionally, 29 tons were landed as guided angler fish. And then in IPHC regulatory area 3A, the charter sector saw additional day closures with landings totaling 845 tons and 4% over the allocation and an additional 4.1 tons were landed as guided angler fish. Landings from private anglers in Alaska totaled 1,432 tons, with the bulk of these landings coming from IPHC regulatory areas 2C and 3A. Subsistence fisheries in Canada and the United States of America run year-round and landed an estimated 530 tons. Estimates in Canada have been carried over since 2007, and estimates in the United States of America have been carried over since last year on the West Coast with a very recent update, 
and since 2016 in Alaska. The total bycatch mortality estimate of Pacific halibut and other fisheries was similar to the amount estimated for 2017 at 2,747 tons, with the mortality in Alaska fisheries in the United States of America accounting for the bulk of this estimate. And the IPHC Fishery Independent Set Line Survey and other research work landed an estimated 376 tons of Pacific halibut coastwide, which we will hear more about shortly from Ms. Giernart and Dr. Webster. And again, just to note that the interactive is available on the IPHC website for the, for the data from, these, um, from this research. As, and also at the registration desk with sign up for a guided walkthrough. So identifying areas where the Pacific halibut mortality was higher than the level projected under the distributed mortality. In Canada, the estimated bycatch mortality in other fisheries was 17% over the projected level. And in the United States of America, in the commercial fisheries and IPHC regulatory area 2A, the Treaty Indian, Indian fishery was 4% over the limit, and the directed fishery was less than 1% over. In the recreational fisheries and IPHC regulatory area 3A, the guided sector was 4% over the limit. In the subsistence fisheries and IPHC regulatory area 4C DNE, Estimated removals were less than 1% over the projected level. And the bycatch mortality in other fisheries was estimated to be 17% over the projected level in IPHC regulatory area 2A, 60% over in 2C, 27% over in 3A, and 12% over in 4B. So identifying or noting concerns with mortality estimates by fishery. For the commercial fishery, there are concerns with the discard mortality estimate in the United States of America in Alaska because of the mean weight that is used as well as the observer coverage rates. For the recreational fisheries for both Canada and the United States of America, there is concern with the self-reporting of lodges and the lack of a current discard mortality estimate. In the subsistence fisheries for both Canada and the United States of America, the concern is the lack of a current estimate. And for, by, for the bycatch mortality in other fisheries in the United States of America, the concerns are the relative observer coverage rates as well as operating challenges. So this is a reminder for all um, license application for the commercial and recreational charter fisheries in IPHC regulatory area 2A that they must be submitted online at our website and by the applicable deadline date. I did not note the charter date as there is no deadline for that fishery application, license application. And while sampling the commercial fishery in Canada, the IPHC Secretariat added the collection of marine mammal details to the skipper interview and is working with fisheries and ocean staff to have these elements added to the joint logbook, which would bring Canadian logbooks in line with logbooks from the United States of America. And the collection of electronic logs through the float application continued to work well in its second year of operation. And coastwide tissue samples were collected from every sampled fish for sex determination of the commercial landings with the initial lab prep now being done in the field. In the United States of America, the Port of Seward saw the greatest amount of Pacific halibut landings for 2018 this port also provided the greatest amount of feedback on the sablefish fishery as small boats fishing with pots adjusted to the, record, the required record keeping and the NOAA fisheries logbook. Did it adjust? Yeah. 
And then a review of the head-on requirement that was um, implemented in 2017 saw 5.4 tons of fresh Pacific halibut being landed from seven vessels, seven vessels in the head-off condition in Canada. And the IPHC continues to follow up with fisheries and oceans on these violations. Uh, 41.8 tons of frozen head-off Pacific halibut were landed in Canada and no head off Pacific halibut was landed in the United States of America. So these are the faces of the IPHC secretariat that you, our stakeholders, see on a regular basis in the ports up and down the coast. And the work these individuals do along with you, um, our stakeholders, feeds directly into the presentations you will see and the discussions you will have this week. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Lara. Is, are there any questions for Lara on her report on the fishery? Uh, Neil? Thanks, Lara. Um, so I just wanted to follow the math a little bit. So I'm on slide six. Um, so for the Treaty Indian Commercial, it says the limit was 390,000 pounds but the fishery went, oh, actually, I'm, I think I'm following now. So the actual catch was 400,000 pounds or about 10,000 pounds over. Is that how I should be reading that? Um, that's correct. So you see that it was 39 million pounds and it came in at 40 million pounds, okay. rounded to. Thank you. Any other questions for Larry? Maybe just uh, an observation there, uh, and it might be in your paper, but do you have a summary table that shows for each one of the regulatory areas a comparison to total mortalities and to what limits are? Uh, yes, to the, to the limits as well as the projected levels and then what the relative removals were? Yeah. Yes, it's table one in right. the paper. All right. By Thanks. regulatory area. Right. Yeah. Thanks, Lara. Um, are we expecting any other data to come in, or is this pretty much it as far as the status of uh, mortalities for 2018? At this point, this is what we've received for 2018. Um, there was an update from the Treaty Indian Tribes for 2A for their subsistence removals, but that was the only recent update. All right, thanks, Lara. Any other comments or questions? Okay, thanks again. We'll move on to the next agenda item. Thank you, Chair. So, yes, yeah, um, Ms. Gearnhart comes up to the podium. She is our fisheries independent set line survey manager, and she will present the work that was done on that survey for 2018. Ms. Tracy Gearnhart. Thanks, Lara. Can everybody hear me okay? Um, thanks, Lara, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm here, as Lara said, to give you a quick review of the set line survey design and the 2018 implementation and with a look forward to what is planned for 2019. Uh, the primary objective of our surveys is the stock assessment. We gather catch per unit effort data along with sex specific length at age composition. Um, the survey allows us to collect data on undersized halibut as well as track trends in halibut distribution and abundance. The set line survey is independent of the data collected from the commercial fishery and has been standardized since 1998. There are 1,265 annual grid stations fished each year um, when we aren't doing the expansion. The survey uh, standardization includes the gear. We fish fixed gear, 1,800 foot skates with 100 number three or 16 aught circle hooks with 18 foot spacing 
and we use a seven to 10 pound weight between the skates. The bait is also standardized. We fish exclusively number two or better, semi-bright chum salmon, and each piece of bait is cut to weigh between a quarter to a third of a pound. And new in 2018, we had the vessel captain confirm with our um, onboard biologists uh, the assessment of the quality of the bait, so they signed off on it. And here's the survey that we ran this year in 2018. The dots represent survey stations, and for the most part, they're a 10 by 10 nautical mile grid. So um, the date range, our surveys ran from May 27th to September 13th this year. And of the 1,496 survey stations planned this season, we finished 1,458, almost 98% were effective for stock assessment. There were seven expansion stations that were dropped because they were either too deep or too shallow once they were prospected by our survey vessels. And just because I know you're curious, um, the ineffective station breakout in 2018, again, this is on our website. You can tunnel down and look at all this stuff. Um, so we had 31 stations that were rated ineffective. 18 were due to whale depredation, and four of those whales were killer whales, and 14 were sperm whales. We had seven stations with sand flea damage and four with um, gear issues. And we had one station lost to shark depredation and one to pinniped depredation. And I know you're curious about the whale depredation. Um, sea samplers record information about all sightings of toothed whales during our survey operations. Less than 2% of the total survey stations had whale observations with killer whales being more common in both number and occurrence than, our, than sperm whales. Sperm whales were seen during, during the haul on 14 sets, and 28 killer whales were sighted while hauling on 28 different sets. Four of these caused the stations to be ineffective due to depredation. Um, and, and killer whale depredation we count as ineffective if there are more than two lips only coming up on the hooks. And with the sperm whales, um, the set is ineffective if we sight a sperm whale during the hauling event. So um, this is also like uh, I said, the, our fifth year and our final year of doing the expansion stations. Um, the expansion stations are meant to fill in gaps in our survey coverage, both deeper and shallower than currently fished, as well as gaps in the current depth zone. So the annual stations here are in blue dots. I know they're kind of hard to see, but um, the expansions are red. Um, and just to show you a review through the a review through the years. So in, two, in uh, 2014, we did area 2A and 4A. In 2015, we did the Bering Flats. In 2016, we did the Shelf Edge. 2017, we returned to 2A and we also did 4B. And then this year we did area 2B and 2C and then or this, sorry, 2018, we did 2B and 2C. And then this year, we're doing 3A and 3B. Okay. So um, as I said, this year, we did area 2B and 2C. So a little bit more um, detail here. In area 2B, an additional 121, 29 stations were fished in addition to the existing 166 annual stations. And these included stations as shallow as nine fathoms and as deep as 399 fathoms. Um, that's 17 meters to 732 meters. Uh, to help with the, manage this expansion in Area 2B, the historical uh, Charlotte and Vancouver charter regions were divided into four new regions identified here as Charlotte North, Charlotte Inside, Vancouver Inside, and Vancouver Outside. In Area 2C, it uh, included um, 121 of the existing annual survey stations with an additional 44 new expansion stations. And these stations were as shallow as nine fathoms and as deep as 436 fathoms or 17 to 797 meters. Mm -hmm. um, surveys have also been a platform for IPHC special projects, including oceanographic data collection. I'm um, seen here on the top right, uh, is a water column profiler. Starting in 2009, the profilers were set on all our stations coastwide. They collect temperature, salinity, dissolved oxygen, pH, and chlorophyll levels throughout the water column. Um, some of the other projects include uh, genetic sampling of halibut, halibut condition factor work, 
contaminant sampling and tagging. Um, and Dr. Planis will be elaborating on the IPHC portion of this research in his talk later this afternoon. Um, the large geographic area covered and the standardization of our survey make it a desirable data collection platform for other researchers and agencies. And we have welcomed a variety of collaborations and a small subset included here. So for Fisheries and Oceans uh, Canada and the Pacific Halibut Management Association, we've had a long collaboration collecting rockfish uh, samples. And this year we also included lingcod on that collection. And on board, we also do 100% uh, hook occupancy data as well as some opportunistic shark sampling, shark sampling in BC. And for National Marine Fisheries NOAA, uh, we've been doing Pacific cod sampling in Western Alaska, and it was expanded to the Gulf of Alaska this year. Um, and we'll probably continue this year, or 2019. Uh, sampling, sample, we've been sampling spiny dogfish, six gill and sleeper sharks. And uh, we've also been using our vessels, a, a small portion of them to do electronic monitoring system tests for, the, for Alaska. We're also working with various state agencies like California, Oregon and Washington. We're helping collect and sample uh, rockfish. So on to this year, 2019. Um, it's our final year of the expansion, and it'll be occurring in Area 3A and 3B, with an additional 89 stations in Area 3A and 67 proposed for 3B. If you were going to bid on the work this year, these are the regions in Area 3A and 3B that will be uh, um, have extra work. And the blue, light blue, are the annual stations, and the green are expansions that have been vetted, and the orange are expansions that um, we're not quite sure if we'll be able to do them given the depth constraints. Also in 2019, we are doing a gear, gear comparison experiment um, to compare the performance of fixed gear to snap gear. The, the comparison is required to evaluate whether data from both gear types can be used in the IPHC stock assessment process. The stations in 2C will be fished twice, once by our standard survey gear and once by snap gear. And this is what the uh, grid pattern will look like. It'll be divided into early and late charters where each gear type will be allocated stations to fish before or after July 15th, which is our middle of our survey season. Vessels of each gear type can fish half, half the stations early and late or bid all stations for their gear type in one of the other early or late charter regions. Bid specs are posted on the website as Lara um, indicated, and the tender forms are uh, due February 15th this year. Uh, we are accepting tender forms via a web application process. If you're interested in any of the IPHC work, please come talk to me. Um, Eric will be here tomorrow as well, and uh, we'll walk you through how to bid the process, how to bid your vessel, and what kind of gear requirements we might need. And you can sign up for the registration desk to talk to me, and I can answer any questions, and so can many of our staff out there. And the last thing I just wanted to say is a big thank you to our vessel skippers and crew and our dedicated IPHC field staff who help, uh, help us collect this data. And that's it. Thank you. Thanks very much, Tracy. Um, can you tell me, or maybe this is a question for uh, Ray, but what's the, this is the last year of the expansion as you were identifying in 3A and 3B. Um, so what's the plan to review all that data and, uh, and provide uh, information back to the Commission on the outcome of looking at expansion across all of, of the ver various regulatory areas? Oh, yes, Commissioner Ryle, I believe that would be a question for Ray to answer. Okay. Dave might be able to. Thanks, Chair. Uh, the, the quick response is that uh, we have already commenced uh, evaluating the expansion information that's been conducted in previous years, noting that 2019 is the last of the uh, expansion series. Uh, Dr. Webster will be examining that data uh, soon after the survey season has been completed. Um, and so specifically for regulatory areas 3A and B, the expansions, we expect to have that uh, analysis done for you for presentation at the next annual meeting in, in 2020. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Dave. I'll just see if there's other questions for Tracy. Bob? 
So I got a question with regards to the whale depredation. You mentioned uh, what was the disqualifying uh, component for a, a set? Since for um, both types of whales or just? Well, I didn't pick up either one. I, I thought it had something to do with two lips, but. <laughs> oh, so, okay. So uh, reviewing the whale depredation. Okay, for uh, sperm whales, if we cite a sperm whale during the hauling event, we are talk, uh, calling that set ineffective. For killer whales, they have to um, be sighted, obviously, but they also have to damage the gear. And so if there's, um, they pull a uh, helmet off the hook and usually there's a lips or only the lips of the helmet are left. Um, and so if we get more than two sets of lips on the, sounds weird, but on the gear, then that disqual disqualifies the gear for uh, a stock assessment. So if I can follow up, um, do you um, interview the skippers on uh, those trips that have a disqualifier where you see uh, whales but may not disqualify a, a set uh, as to whether the skipper believes there has been interaction uh, that would uh, uh, that a, a set should be disqualified or not? Uh, maybe you never saw the lips, but they felt that it had been interfered with. The the lead um, commissioner Alverson, the lead uh, biologist on board, and their partner and the skipper would be discussing that. And um, if there was uh, damage to the gear and the whales, it, it's somewhat subjective. But um, for the killer whales, we require the, there to be some evidence of them pulling the um, fish off the hooks. I had a question on the profilers. Yeah, go ahead, Bob. <clears throat> so we've had these warm water conditions in the Gulf of Alaska, um, even up into the Bering Sea. Do our profilers um, assist in what, you know, uh, satellite imagery is giving, or do we have a, re is there an ongoing report of, you know, what that's picking up and how it may correlate with other uh, environmental conditions going on? Um, yes, Commissioner, Commissioner Alverson, we are, that data is being used. And um, last year, I believe we were tracking our profilers along with um, the various uh, agencies in Washington, Oregon to confirm or deny the presence of the uh, anoxic zone. Um, it can happen in real time, but I believe the, rep I'm not sure if the reports uh, are online on our site or not, but I believe Dr. Planis would be able to answer that question this afternoon. Any other questions for uh, Tracy? Yeah, Peter, go ahead. Yeah, on, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, on slide 12, uh, you define uh, for the expansion stations, um, expansions vetted uh, versus expansions to prospect. I just was hoping to get some clarity on the difference. Yes, um, Commissioner DeGrief. Uh, so in the office, when uh, Ray proposes uh, stations to fish for expansion, um, our survey team will examine uh, the actual location on a, a nautical chart and zoom in and look at it. Some of them, um, we are pretty confident that they can fish effectively with um, our survey sort of parameters. Um, but the ones in orange uh, are, um, for lack of a better word, a little bit dodgy. We don't know if um, uh, the bathymetric data would match uh, our station parameters, so it has to conform to a certain depth zone. Um, and so what happens in this case is that we would expect the boat to essentially prospect that station to see if it uh, conforms to our, our definition of what an ac um, accurate survey station or a good survey station would be. Does that answer your question? Yes, it does. Thank you. All right. Um, not seeing any other questions for you. Thank you very much, Tracy. Just before we go on to the um, next agenda item, uh, Dave, I just when we were talking about changes to the website and um, and material for the commission, I did uh, note as well when I was looking at one of the reports from the commission that there was quite a number of. Uh, peer-reviewed publications that the staff have done. Um, I don't remember them all because there was quite a number of them. 
And so uh, Dr. Webster, Dr. Hicks, Dr. Lohr, um, and Dr. Stewart, and I'm probably missing others that have also done presentations, but, or excuse me, um, uh, papers that have been published in peer-reviewed uh, papers. And I, first off, I'd like to um, make note of that to the audience at large, that you will see that these present, these papers are um, put forward into peer-reviewed uh, documents. Um, and also, I mean, it, it's quite a, a effort uh, to undertake to get those uh, papers published, uh, put together and published. And I just would like to offer my congratulations to, <clears throat> to your staff for undertaking that um, on top of their other duties. I do think it's important to have it um, go through that route. It increases the transparency and, in a, and I said peer reviewed a couple of times, but it's important to have um, science being peer reviewed and brings new ideas and provides um, um, transparency, but also credibility to the the commission and the work that it does. So I just wanted to offer that up before we move on, Dave. So um, the next uh, uh, agenda item is um, is by Dr. Webster, and so Ray, if uh, you're going to provide us a space time modeling of survey data. Good afternoon. Yes, I'll be presenting. Um, a review of the space-time modeling of the survey data undertaken in 2018. And I'll begin by reviewing the data sources that go into this modeling and um, the space-time modeling itself, and then present the estimates that are the output of the space-time modeling of the density and abundance indices of weight per unit effort and numbers per unit effort. And um, following on Tracy's talk, I'll present some interesting results from the um, survey expansions undertaken in 2018, which were undertaken in regulatory areas 2A, 2B, and 2C, and a review of some other space-time modeling related work done in 2018. So to begin, the data sources that go into the space-time models, the primary data source is our own set line survey, our own fishery independent set line survey. And that's the primary data source for the space-time modeling of the weight per, unit, weight per unit effort and numbers per unit effort indices, which are input for the stock assessment and for estimation of stock distribution. And as Tracy has reviewed, we have a 10 nautical mile standard grid design, which has been fished since 1998 in this design with fixed stations um, and standardized fishing methods. And this grid design ensures that all habitat is sampled in proportion to its occurrence on average. And the fixed station design versus, a, as opposed to a randomized design, um, reduces variance in the trend estimates compared to randomizing the stations every year. Having the same stations every year gives us more precise estimates of trends. Now there are gaps in the annual coverage and we account for those by using data from other surveys, which I'll review in a moment, by through the expansion program that we've been undertaking over the last few years and through space-time model predictions into unsurveyed habitat if we don't have direct observations in a given year. Another important data source in the Bering Sea is the NIMS um, Fishery Independent Bering Sea Troll Survey. We don't have comprehensive coverage of our own survey in the Bering Sea every year. Um, and so this is an important complementary data source for estimating the density indices in the Bering Sea, which includes regulatory areas 4A and 4CBE. The basic survey design is a 20 nautical mile grid design, which has been in place since 1982, with higher dense station density in some regions. And in uh, 2010, 2017, and 2018, and I believe again this year, there were expansions into the Northern Bering Sea, which provide us with extremely important data for um, coming up with de density estimates for that relatively large region of the Bering Sea too. Now these NIMS troll survey data, um, they catch different size distributions of fish from our own set line survey. So we need to undertake a calibration to ensure that what we're getting out of those data um, is consistent with the um, indices that we produce from the set line survey. And we do this by doing a calibration with the data we got from our own expansion into that um, part of the Bering Sea in 2006 and 2015. A couple of other sources of data that are input into the space-time models. We have the Alaska Department of Fish and Game Fisheries Independence 
Northern Sound Troll Survey, which again is a data source for the indices in the Northern Bering Sea, regulatory area 4CD. And this was fished approximately triennially until 2014 and annually since 2017. So that's two years in a row at least so far of an annual survey. And that is as implied by the name undertaken in the Northern Sound region of the Northern Bering Sea. And we also use the NIMS Fishery Independent Sablefish Longline Survey in areas 3A and 3B to provide us, provide us with some information on halibut densities in the deepest waters that we consider halibut habitat. Um, bearing in mind that we have not had expansions into those deeper waters in 3A and 3B um, at this point, but we will be undertaking those expansions in 2019. So the space-time modeling itself. Space-time modeling has been in place since 2016 as, a, as an improved way of producing weight per unit effort and numbers per unit effort estimates of those density indices. And the modeling has two key purposes. It smooths the data in time and space. So it removes noise, random noise in the data. So it makes use of information, it does this in a, in a clever way by making use of information on the spatial and temporal relationships among survey stations. Stations that are close to each other in time or in space tend to have, tend to be more likely to have similar um, halibut density as well. And so it does this um, in order to sort the signal from the noise. What's the underlying density versus um, just random processes that are occurring to produce the weight per unit effort or numbers per unit effort that we observe on the survey. And it also fills gaps in survey coverage using model predictions while accounting for uncertainty in those predictions. And our own scientific review board, which is our own internal peer review process, um, again endorsed the space-time modeling approach in 2018. And that was their sixth review of the space-time modeling approach. So turning to the output from this modeling approach, um, as in 2016 and 2017, we estimated 032 weight per unit effort and all sizes numbers per unit effort indices. And we also estimated all sizes weight per unit effort, which we did for the first time in 2017. And these estimates are computed for biological regions for each of our IPHE regulatory areas. And we come up with a coastwide estimate um, for the entire IPHC convention waters from San Francisco Bay to the Bering Strait. This is um, probably the, the key output from um, the space-time model in terms of O32 weight per unit effort. This is O32 weight per unit effort by biological region. And Dr. Stewart will be talking more about um, these biological regions. But region two is 2A, 2B, and 2C, and, um, and so on. So just to explain what we're seeing here, the points, circles on the, on each, in each panel, represent our estimate of O32 weight per unit effort by year with years along the, the horizontal axis and O32 weight per unit effort in pounds per skate along the vertical axis. The, the um, shaded region around those points are 95% intervals. So what they mean is there's a 95% chance that the true value, remember these are estimates, that the true value is within that shaded region. So it expresses the amount of certainty or uncertainty we have in those estimates. The wider those shaded regions, uh, the, the less certainty we have, the narrower, the greater certainty we have. So you can see in, mo in most areas, most regions, we have quite precise estimates in most years, reflecting the comprehensive nature of our survey. Um, and in the bottom left-hand corner, the um, numbers there represent the percent change in the estimated indices from 2017 to 2018. And as you can see, in most regions in the past year, um, there was a modest decrease in the estimate of the indices, um, the exception being region 4B, we had, where we had an estimate of 12% increase. Likewise, for numbers per unit effort, um, we tend to, in most regions, we have slightly larger decreases in the, from um, 2017 to 2018, and somewhat more uncertainty as well, particularly in, in regions in region three, where we have yet to have a set line survey expansion. Oops, I'm sorry, ran away from me. This, um, this figure compares by biological region again, the O32 weight per unit effort in the pinker color with the all sizes weight per unit effort. And the interesting thing about this comparison is that you can see 
in the most, two most recent years, those two series have converged. They're closer to each other than in previous years. And that reflects the, the um, smaller number of small halibut that we've been getting on the survey in, in the last two years. So um, that um, leads to um, the all sizes weight peon effort being closer to the O32 weight peon effort. And that's true in, um, throughout the coast. And I've hit the. Okay. Now, turning to the survey expansions, which Tracy has um, introduced in detail, this was the fifth year of a program of set line survey expansions. Um, in 2018, we targeted regulatory areas 2B and 2C. We also repeated the ad hoc expansion of the North Washington coast first undertaken in 2017, the so-called densified grid, where we doubled the station density off the North Washington coast. And the purpose of that was um, to um, address concerns that with the current, with this, the usual station density on the 10 nautical mile grid that we may be missing localized patches of high density. And so we doubled the station density off the Washington coast in 2017 and 2018. And the results of all of these expansions is a cumulative update of the full time series of weight peon effort numbers peon effort, which uses all available data to date. And this update leads to reduced bias and uncertainty in weight peon effort and numbers peon effort estimates. And we'll see the effect of this cumulative update um, quite clearly in when we examine the expansions for the um, for regulatory areas 2B and 2C. So this is a map showing O32 weight peon effort. This is raw data, not space-time model output, um, from our set line survey in 2018 in regulatory area 2B. And I'll step through what the different symbols mean in this, um, in this map, because there's quite a bit going on here. First, most of the symbols are circles. These, these side, the area of the circle is proportional to the O32 weight peon effort at that location. Each point is a set line survey station that we fished attempted to fish or hoped to fish in 2018. So you can see there's some um, large circles. Um, the largest one is uh, off the south coast of Haida Gwaii, south southern point of Haida Gwaii. That had our highest weight per unit effort in 2018. And then the smaller circles. And down to the X symbol represents zero pounds per scape. Those are stations at which we caught no O32 halibut. Um, we, Tracy talked about ineffective stations and the reasons why stations might be ineffective. There are, um, I believe, a couple of those in regulatory area, maybe just one in regulatory area 2B, and they're represented by a square with a X in it. And the final symbol is the circle with the X through it. Those are stations which we were, were prohibited from fishing in 2018 because of some kind of protected um, area that we were excluded from, um, marine protection areas or rockfish conservation areas. And so um, the figure you'll notice, there are also three different shadings. The gray symbols at the top and at the bottom are those that we count towards regulatory areas 2C and 2A, and those are included for comparison. The colored symbols are the ones that are part of, that form part of the area of area 2B's index. And so there are two colors, the purple color, the darker symbols, are those stations that we fished on an annual basis up until 2018. And the sort of teal color are those expansion stations that we fished for the first time in 2018. And you can see those expansion stations tend to fall into clusters where we've had relatively large areas of, un, um, of um, no survey coverage in past years. And a couple of those include just east of Haida Gwaii and Dogfish Bank. And that's an area with somewhat below average weight pure effort. Um, there's an area in the inside waters in the northeast, um, offshore and inside waters, which tended to have higher weight per unit effort than average. And then probably the, the largest area that we hadn't covered previously was the Strait of Georgia and other inside waters in the south, where we caught um, very few halibut. If you look closely, you can see some dots on the map, and those dots um, in, in the vicinity of the Strait of Georgia, there's maybe three or four of them, and a couple in the Strait of Juan de Fuca, they tend to represent one or two halibut. So very low densities were um, estimated to be in, the, in those inside waters in 2018. So what was the effect of this expansion on the index in um, regulatory area 2B? So this is the O32 time series for regulatory area 2B. 
it's a comparison of the 2017 output, which is the lighter color, the pinker orangey color on the top, and the output from the 2018 model. And so the effect of those expansions is that um, we brought the entire time series down. And the reason for that is that on average, the weight per unit effort in all of regulatory area 2B was somewhat lower than in regulatory area 2B, just using the um, annually fished stations. So that was largely due to the near zero halibut catch rates in Strait of Georgia and nearby inside waters. Um, so that's what I'm talking about when I say this cumulative update. We've updated the entire time series based on information in areas that we hadn't previously fished. Um, what this means is that we've been, while we estimated in those areas uh, an index in past years, um, our estimate was too high. Um, and this time we got some data, some real data in those areas, which allowed us to reevaluate those estimates. But on the positive side of things, as you see, there is a, an uptick in wave per unit effort at the end of the time series. So we do estimate an increase in O32 wave per unit effort from 2017 to 2018. Now, one question I received at the interim meeting was what would we have had if we hadn't done the expansion in 2018? So I was able to refit the model without the expansion data, without those new stations. And that red point there is the estimate we would have got in 2018 had we not done the expansion. And you can see it follows the same pattern, a slight uptick in, from last year. So that it doesn't have much of an effect on the trend. But um, it's again that shift upwards in the time series. And this comparison between that red point and the blue point below it is, is a, is an est provides an estimate of the bias. So we had positive bias in our estimates previously because we were overestimating, in particular, the catch rates in those inside waters. So that provides an estimate of bias. And you'll notice that value without the expansion stations is outside of the shaded region around our estimate, which includes all of the data we got in, in 2018. Um, and in fact, there's only a, a four in 1,000 chance that the true value is at least as big as that red point there. So it's not a, not a plausible estimate given the knowledge that we have from the full 2018 survey. Um, similar um, update in the time series for numbers per unit effort for 2B and moving on to 2C. In 2C, we didn't have large regions of, of um, zero coverage. The, the expansion stations, again in teal color here, are, tend to be more scattered through regulatory area um, 2C. And so the effect on um, the time series was much smaller. In fact, in recent years, there's no um, discernible effect. The estimates are both within the um, of the 2017 output and the 20 output, 2018 output are within the um, our estimate of uncertainty for all years. What I didn't point out and meant to point out with the 2B time series is not only do we re-evaluate re, um, the time series and reduce bias, particularly in 2B, but we also have more precise estimates now. Those shaded regions have shrunk um, now that we have this new data, particularly in the in the years closer to 2018 where the data were collected. Although you may, if you go back to the 2B figure, you'll see that um, we have improvements in precision throughout the time series. So it's reduced bias and it's improved precision. And this is probably most striking in the numbers per unit effort time series for regulatory area 2C, where we have made very large gains in precision in our understanding of the index and the time series for that regulatory area. So in summary, the data from 2018 expansions, they improved our understanding of the distribution of Pacific halibut within those regulatory areas. We went to areas we'd never surveyed before and got our first snapshot, first understanding of what the halibut densities are in those areas. And by doing this, we reduced both bias and uncertainty in those indices. And that's something that we've done pretty much every year that we've done one of these expansions. And we expect the same thing to happen in um, 2019 and two, in um, 3A and 3B. And so following completion of the planned exp expansions in 2019, we would not expect similar subsequent large revisions as we saw in 2B in the entire time series. And we've gone there once, we've got a good look at, at what the densities are like, we revise the time series. Um, what happens in the future is likely to have a much smaller effect. So all previous gaps in the set line survey will have been sampled at least once once we complete the expansion in 2019. And the future sampling of expansion stations, once we 
decide what our plan going forwards will be, will mainly affect the most recent year's estimates, not the full time series. The final um, expansion that we did in 2018 was a revisiting of that densified grid off the North Washington coast. And this map, um, again, the size of the circle is proportional to the 032 weight per unit effort, the area of the circle. The X's represent stations in which we caught no 032 halibut, largely in the Salish Sea. Um, and you'll see that the, above that dotted line, um, the station density is double what we typically have. The colors underneath are um, data from our water column profilers, which um, again, Tracy mentioned, where we collect a number of environmental variables. And one of the key ones, particularly in regulatory area 2A, is dissolved oxygen. And in 2018, we had no evidence for that large hypoxic zone that we observed off the Washington coast when we did our survey in 2017. And so we have non-zero catch rates at all but a handful of stations off the North Washington coast in 2018, which is quite the contrast for what we had in 2017. And you'll see that dark purple area with the dashed white line around it. That's, um, that was the hypoxic zone. That was a zone with um, dissolved oxygen less than 0.9 milliliters per liter. And this data, these data and data that we've previously examined show that catch rates typically are zero or close to zero when you have um, dissolved oxygen levels that low. And that's what we observed in 2017, but there was no similar event off the North Washington coast in 2018. And um, as a consequence of that, catch rates um, bounced back up off the North Washington coast last year. So we were interested in the effect of this um, densified grid in, on our estimates of 032 weight per unit effort. Did it perhaps um, reduce bias or improve the precision? And it, it really did neither of those things. Um, the estimates we got, including the data from the dense grid, were um, basically indistinguishable from those we get without the dense grid. And I should add that we do use the dense grid data in our estimates. We don't like to throw away data but um, it did not help um, improve our estimates in terms of bias and um, precision. And you can see to any meaningful degree, and you can see that the estimates without the dense grid data, which is the lighter colored um, orangey line, and the, the bluer line is with the data, um, they're both well within the, the uncertainty um, uh, that characterizes those estimates. So in summary, um, the 2018 survey of the dense grid stations confirmed our conclusion in 20. 2018 survey confirmed our conclusion of the 2017 survey that the increase in station density did not have a meaningful effect on the estimates. And we have no scientific justification or benefit in repeating this ad hoc increase in station density in the future. And finally, um, just this quick summary of a couple of other things we did related to space time modeling in 2018. We examined um, our set line survey 20 hook counts. Well, what are these? Um, in most regulatory areas, all species, not just halibut, are counted on the first 20 hooks per skate. We have 100 hooks per skate, so we count the first 20, which more or less 20% of all hooks um, to get at um, the, the non-target species and other things that uh, we're getting on those hooks. And that's important information um, for the, the um, input to the space-time modeling because we use those data to estimate the hook competition adjustment factors, particularly the baits returned, give us um, a way of estimating the amount of competition for baits. If we get a lot of baits back, there was less competition for those baits with halibut. Um, if we get few baits back, there was more competition and we'd have a relative adjustment upwards in the index compared to um, getting few baits back. So we wanted to know, is, uh, is 20 hooks per skate sufficient given the importance of these adjustment factors as um, part of the input into the space-time model? And we use the data in regulatory area 2B to assess this. In regulatory area 2B, we have um, had 100% hook counts in most of the last almost nine, 10 years now. And so we were able to look at, um, compare analysis using the, a subset of those data, just based on the 20 hook counts, and compare the estimates we get from the 100% hook counts. And we found um, no meaningful differences in the space-time model, model estimates based on 20 hook counts for regulatory area 2B compared with 100% hook counts that we, we are using. And our conclusion was that, um, that 20 hook counts are sufficient 
in order to come up with regulatory area estimates of um, O32 weight PM effort. The other piece of space-time modeling work was focused on regulatory area 2A, and we talked about the um, effect of dissolved oxygen in particular there on halibut catch rates. So we were interested in if the inclusion of environmental covariate data from uh, the um, water column profilers um, in models of O32 weight per unit effort, um, would that lead to improved estimates? So we fitted the space-time models with not only dissolved oxygen, but also with bottom temperature. And we found not surprising, given the figures I maps I showed you earlier, that there's strong evidence of a relationship between O32 weight per unit effort and dissolved oxygen. However, the inclusion of this variable in the models didn't have a meaningful effect on the estimates. It didn't, in terms of um, uh, bias or uncertainty, or the estimate itself or the uncertainty in the estimate. And the reason for that is um, that when we have direct observations at a particular location, as we do at all of these sites where we also have the um, environmental covariate data, then that's sufficient to get a good estimate for, um, produce a good estimate for that regulatory area. Where this covariate information would really um, benefit us is if we were able to get estimates of dissolved oxygen or bottom temperature or other covariates at places where we didn't have um, our own direct observation of, of halibut catch rates. So for example, if um, there was a Troll survey, the West Coast Troll Survey went to California and they got some of this covariate information. We could use that to come up with a better estimate in California than we would have got in a year in which we didn't do our own survey. So there's still potential um, if we can get estimates of the, um, get measures of these covariates um, outside of our own survey range, um, but, um, but uh, it didn't help us with this year's estimates. And the SRB, um, stated the following in their June 2018 review, and they agreed that while the dissolved oxygen levels improved, the space-time model fits to the set line survey data, the results were not compelling or wide, widespread enough to warrant routine inclusion in the stock assessment process or in the index standardization. But the results of dissolved oxygen could be reported at the own meeting, which is what I did in the presentation of those maps. And that's the end of the material I have, so I'll welcome any questions from commissioners. Thanks very much, Ray. Are there questions for Ray on his presentation? Neil? Thanks, Ray. So uh, I'm just gonna pull the slide up here. I was looking at the, um, the slides where you were illustrating the survey results for 2B and 2C. So the first slide I'm looking at is slide 13. And as you know, because the lines are on the map, between um, the northern border of 2B and 2C, there is there are differing views about what the border is. And it looks to me like the survey stations within the disputed area are being assigned to 2C. So my first question is, am I reading that right? And then my second question is, if I am, uh, is there any particular reason they're being assigned to 2C and not 2B? So my, <clears throat> we have a compromise line, which is supposed to split um, through the middle of that line. And this, um, my understanding is that in the past, our stations were assigned based on um, that dividing line. So some of this, not all of the stations, let's see, there are, I think, two stations. It's a bit hard to see because the points kind of smother the line, the two, the, um, US preferred line, which is the Southern line. But a couple of those stations are, I think, are counted within 2B, although they're on the US preferred side of that line. So we have a compromise line that I haven't showed on this map and the stations were assigned on the basis of that line. Um, I'm happy to um, find a figure which shows that line to the commissioners. Other questions for Ray? Ray, maybe we could take a look at slide nine. So like, looking there, there was um, quite an improvement over the years in precision in a number of the areas. And so is that because of, in, well, what's the reason for that? It's because of improvements in the coverage of the survey. So in those early years in the, in the, um, 19, in the um, 1990s, 
we didn't have a survey every year. This coverage of the survey in some regulatory areas wasn't comprehensive. Um, so um, that's largely the result of that. So it wasn't until 1998 that our, our um, survey became um, much more consistent with that introduction of the 10 nautic mile grid and fishing almost all regulatory areas every year. Um, there's also a, an element, and particularly you'll, if perhaps hard to see at the regional level, but the, area, the years in which we had a survey expansion. So for example, in 2018, you'll, it's a little hard to see, but the, the intervals are quite a bit tighter in 2018 in region two, for example, than they are in previous years. The other part of that is that there's a proportionality here um, that um, in the absence of anything else changing like survey coverage, you tend to get um, uh, greater uncertainty in an absolute sense um, in proportion to the index itself. Um, but in a relative sense where you divide the, say the standard deviation by the, the index to get a coefficient of variation, um, you'd find much less variation from year to year. So relative um, uncertainty uh, is, um, is more consistent, more stable than, um, than what you see in those figures. So hopefully that answers your question. Yeah, it does. Thanks, Ray. Um, just maybe a follow-up one on the same kind of issue. If we go to slide 10, on the, this is on the NPUE. Um, do see similar trends um, as the previous slide. I guess with the, maybe the exception of Region 3, which seems to have the same precision values throughout the whole time series. And just wondering why that would be the case. And, and Yes, this is the only region in which we have yet to have a survey expansion. Um, you, there is, um, I think, greater uncertainty in the very early years, but we had um, surveys in regulatory area 3A and 3B um, more consistently than I think in other areas in the, in the 90s, so we'd expect a bit more consistency. Um, but the greater uncertainty in that region is largely due to the fact that we haven't had an expansion but we still have some fairly decent amount of unsurveyed, uncovered habitat, particularly in um, the vicinity of Prince William Sound and um, Cook Inlet in regulatory area 3A and the Shubigan Islands in regulatory area 3B. So we would expect in the same way we saw the um, uncertainty in the 2C series this year for numbers being an effort to decrease substantially, we would expect the same thing to happen following the expansion in 2019 in region three and individually in particular um, regulatory area 3A. Thanks, Ray. I, just on Cook Inlet, I, I noticed that there was a portions of that were not um, having expansion stations and maybe just clarify the reason for why that's not being covered. Can I clarify the question? Um, yeah, Commissioner uh, and I noticed in a, a chart of um, showing the expansion proposals for um, I guess it's 3A, that uh, Cook Inlet, there's not expansion stations in the upper part of it, and I'm sure there's a good reason for that, but maybe um, if you could just provide what the rationale is. Yes, I can explain that. Um, thank you for the question. Um, we target the 10 to 400 fathom depth range with our set line survey because it, became, it can be difficult fishing the long line gear shallower than 10 fathoms, and that northern part of Cook Inlet is a very shallow area. It's um, highly tidal. Um, if you fly over it, you'll see it it'll, looks like mud most of the time. And so most of that area is um, um, too shallow for us to undertake our set line survey. Okay, thanks, Ray. And a final question for me is, um, so where to from here? The expansions will occur in 3A and 3B this year. Um, we've done all the other areas. So what's uh, the plan to I guess, review the data and where to from here. Maybe you could just fill us in on what your plans are there. Yes, so the plan is to, as mentioned, to review all the data we've got from the expansions and the annual set line survey um, in order to come up with a plan going forward of what's the best way to undertake this survey every year. Um, so we would be looking at the um, precision in the estimates. We want to maintain precise estimates. We want to be able to capture trends um, and not miss them from one year to the next in any survey going forward. But that doesn't mean we need to fish every station every year. 
Um, for example, in regulatory area 2A, we don't fish California every year, but we still have a precise survey and we still feel we can track the trends in that um, regulatory area each year. So we'll be looking at um, um, different, I imagine we'll be looking at different scenarios where we um, try fitting space time models with and without parts of the data. Um, you'll find that the greatest impact on missing a year in, of a part of a region or an entire regulatory area will be in the year itself. Um, that that um, that will be where the greatest uncertainty is. Um, so um, we we need to make sure that if we're leaving anything out, it doesn't compromise the integrity of the estimates that we're getting from a survey. And we'll have to balance uh, any decisions we make with with the cost of undertaking the survey. So. Uh, it, it's probably cost prohibitive to fish California every year, if, even if the, if the analysis said we, we should do that. And so there'll be a compromise there. And there's also um, a, a um, cost in leaving out parts in which we catch high numbers of halibut because they help fund um, the survey. So all of those things will be reviewed and the plan is to develop the methods um, in the first part of this year um, present those methods and some preliminary results for the areas in which we have completed the surveys, the expansions um, to the scientific review board at their June meeting, and um, then um, present those at the work meeting in September to the commissioners. And then finally, when we have all the 3A and 3B analyses completed, then we can present those results at the interim and annual meetings. All right, thanks very much, Ray. I see Bob has a question. So Dr. Webster, um, I don't know if I'm going to get this question. I'm sure you'll bit, get it from some of the industry uh, throughout the week, but um, I'm looking at slide 16. I also looked at slide 13, but um, for right now I'm looking at Southeast Alaska. And this has to do with your smoothing um, operation on, on the weight per unit of effort. We have these, uh, these these uh, survey stations that we know we're not going to have a very big catch. In fact, some of them continually produce maybe a zero or an X or very low numbers. And um, I've always thought that when you average those with the good stations, it, it's smooth by itself. But uh, there's a feeling that the smoothing operation you apply only smooths down. Does, this, does it only net down or is there a smoothing that goes up on some stations with your your modeling. No, it's not a, no, yeah, I, it's not a smoothing down. Um, it's a smoothing across or a smoothing through time. So um, when we did the original presentation of the space time model in 2016, I presented a comparison of um, the time series using the methods we used previously with the, with the time series for um, weight unit effort, numbers of unit effort that were output from the space time model. And overall, they were, this, they were telling the same story. There wasn't really a shift up or down, um, but one was a smoother time series than the other. And that, that's a, a general summary, but that, that I believe that was true. So um, I don't see that in the data that we're smoothing down in, on average or smoothing up on average. And that would be, um, it, it's not how that works. So. If you have a, try, maybe I'll try and illustrate this. So this is the raw data. If you have a station which is, um, has very high weight per unit effort, um, it could be that you have really high density there, but if that station is then surrounded by stations with relatively low weight per unit effort, then um, it's gonna make use of the, est the estimate that we get from the space time model for that particular point. And we're not interested in general at, at particular points, we're interested in the whole regulatory area but that would be um, likely to be brought down because the overall picture, we know there's association, um, spatial dependence in those stations um, and that would, um, there'll be some effect of those neighboring stations. It won't bring it down to the same value as those neighboring stations, neighboring stations but um, it will attenuate it somewhat. But the opposite is also true. If you have a station with low density and it's surrounded by uh, low catch rates and it's surrounded by high catch rates all around it and probably can find a couple there um, the model will say, well, the model will interpret that as um, having um, been um, something that was possibly a random event. So uh, with all these high density stations in a high density area, 
in the absence of any other covariate data, the estimate from the space-time model for that location will be higher than what you observed um, directly. So it's a smoothing in space in that sense, but also it's a smoothing in time. So if we have a station which this year um, had low catch rates, but every other year had high catch rates, then um, the effect of those higher, value, the higher values in the past will be to bring that station up a bit relative to what you observe directly. So it's a smoothing in both directions, depending on what the data tell us. And the model um, allows us to estimate how much smoothing to do, how, how close, how similar are stations in space and time. Each regulatory area, we estimate a different parameter for that, what parameter in time and a parameter in space. And we tend to find in most areas, high association, um, high correlation in the catch rates out to about 30 nautical miles. It, it depends on area, but in most areas, it's something like that. So you get some influence out to about 30 nautical miles, which is about three stations out. As with that influence decreasing, the further out you go. Um, and there's a very high correlation in time as well, that an observation in one year is something like 90% 90 correlation with um, the observation the previous year or the subsequent year. So it shouldn't be going up and down on average. It should be on average getting the same thing, but just um, with um, smoothing throughout the, throughout the region and throughout time. Uh, Peter? Yeah, I just have a, sorry. I just have a question on uh, slide five, um, data sources. Um, the Sablefish uh, set line survey, when, is, when does that take place? Is it the same time as the uh, IPHC set line survey? It's also a summer survey, yes. Sorry. It, uh, is, it is also um, undertaken in the summer months. It's at the exact same time. It's, it's, it's in the same period covered by the set line survey, yes. Sorry, thank you. All right, thanks very much, Ray, for the presentation. Thank you. I'm going to move on to uh, agenda item 6.3. Um, Dr. Stewart's going to give us an uh, update on stock assessment and, um, and some draft harvest decision tables. So, so far, we're pretty much on target for uh, agenda time. Just so you know that um, uh, we will be taking a break around uh, 3.30. Um, so after uh, Ian goes through his presentation on the first part, he will follow up after on some mortality projections following the break on item 6.4. Yep, over to you. Thanks, uh, Ian. Okay, well, thank you, and uh, good afternoon. I'd like to start out this afternoon by reflecting for just a second on uh, the, the stock dynamics, a comparison between where we are now and where we were seven years ago, when, in fact, I was standing right here at this podium in this room uh, describing the stock dynamics at that time. The spawning biomass is at a very similar level to where we were seven years ago, but the population dynamics are substantially different. At that time, we were trying to understand fairly large decreases in spawning biomass that had occurred over the last 10 years. And that was being largely driven at that time by changes in size at age. Halibut were about half the size that they were in the 1970s, um, just, just in the last 10 years. Now, seven years later, and at the conclusion or near conclusion of a substantial effort to improve our set line survey, we know a lot more about the stock and the stock dynamics. What the population dynamics are being driven by now is not further change in size at age, but it's in recent recruitment dynamics. And as you'll see in my presentation, the, the recent recruitment dynamics are being driven by a gap from 2006 through 2010, which is going to continue to work its way through our, our fishery um, and into the spawning biomass. But nonetheless, um, we are at nearly the same place with regard to the amount of halibut that are in the water and available to the spawning biomass at this time. I'm going to be presenting uh, very similar information to what I presented at the interim meeting. I'd like to start out with a, a quick summary of some of the main bullets from this year's results. 
the first is, as you've seen from the, the presentations leading up to mine, uh, at least with regard to the survey, both the fishery and the, the modeled survey trends are down coastwide. Uh, virtually all biological regions and regulatory areas have shown a, a decrease over the last uh, couple of years. The estimates coming out of this year's stock assessment, however, are slightly larger than we saw from last year's stock assessment, and that's reflecting the new information we have from the Setline survey, as well as observations of incoming recruitments in the 2011 and 2012 year classes, which have resulted in a slight, slight reduction in our estimate of fishing intensity occurring in the, in the last several years, as well as projected to occur over the next couple of years. However, the, the challenge that we have this year is that the spawning biomass is estimated to be decreasing gradually, and that trend is expected to continue. The available yield in the Pacific halibut stock right now is small. The fish are small for their age, and we have seen a reduction in recruitment in the last several years. And what that means is that for any removals of TCEYs at the coastwide level of more than around 20 million pounds, uh, we are likely to see continued slow decrease in, this, in both the spawning biomass and in the available yield from the Pacific halibut stock over the next several years. However, I will note that pending the last year of the survey expansion and another observation of these potentially slightly better incoming recruits, recruitment events in 2011 and 12, we do have a slightly larger degree of uncertainty in this year's stock assessment results. As I mentioned, I'll be going through most of the same material that I presented at the interim meeting. However, uh, in response to a number of questions that we had at that meeting and subsequently, I, I've added some additional material. In addition, we now have uh, full documentation available for this, the, the results that I'll be speaking to today. So I encourage you to look at papers eight and nine, which outline the overview of all the data sources that are available for the Pacific halibut stock. There's a much greater level of detail in that document than I will go into in this presentation. Document nine provides more detail in the results of the stock assessment this year. And then finally, I'll be looking at the mortality projection tool, which I hope, I know many of you have already explored and used on our website. Um, and that tool is reflected in document 11, and you'll also find that linked at the top of our um, annual meeting web page. So moving right into the uh, data sources and then the stock assessment. You heard from uh, my colleague, Ms. Erickson, the recent summary of the 2018 fishing season, but I'd like to start by putting that into some historical context. So this is the time series of all sources of mortality back into the 1960s. As you can see, the Pacific halibut stock has produced a a highly variable amount of yield over this time period, from peaks in the early 2000s of just over 100 million pounds of total mortality, down to lows in the low 30 million pound range in the late 1970s. We are currently down at a level just above the, that that we saw in the late 1970s. And you see at the very end of that time series that the adopted catch limits by the two countries for 2018 served to reduce the overall level of mortality by 8% from 2017 to 2018. So after a period of nearly flat removals at around 42, 42 and a half million pounds, uh, we did see a decrease in response to those catch limits that were set for 2018. Now this table breaks down a little bit in, in a little bit more detail, those major components contributing to the sources of mortality for Pacific halibut. You may note a couple of small differences between this table and the table that you saw from Ms. Erickson. Uh, these, the numbers that I have presented in this table were those that are available and used in this year's stock assessment. There are some trivial differences in those estimates, and it's a good reminder that none of these data sets is ever completely final. So we, we will be receiving over this calendar year some additional information on some of these sources, and that we, we update that each fall moving into the next stock assessment. So we, we would anticipate um, further small revisions to some of these numbers. However, in the bigger picture, um, the, the, the trends tend to be very stable over time um, compared to what we see going into the assessment and what we see the subsequent, in subsequent years. So noting that the total amount of mortality was relatively stable over the previous five years and then dropped by around 8% in 2018, you can see that most of that um, 
decrease occurred in the commercial and the recreational sectors. Both of those sectors are actually very close to where they were in 2014, where we had an additional 4 million pounds of overall removals occurring. And the reason for that is that over that, this same time period, we've seen a decrease from around 1.3 million pounds of discard mortality in the commercial fishery. Now, these discards are primarily driven by the minimum size limit. So this is encounters of sublegal halibut that are discarded and subsequently die. You see that numbers come down from around 1.3 to near 0 0.8 million pounds of mortality from that source. And that's a reflection of a reduced encounter rate with sublegal halibut across the fishery. Further, in the um, second to last column on the right, you can see that the estimates of bycatch from non-halibut fisheries have come down from just under 9 million pounds to just over 6 million pounds in this five-year period. So nearly a one-third reduction in estimates of bycatch mortality over this time period. Most of these reductions are coming from sectors within other fisheries that do not target halibut that are well observed. Primarily, um, a large part of these uh, reductions have come in the Bering Sea, and those large industrial fleets in the Bering Sea ha have high observer coverage, 100 or even 200% coverage. And so, although we do have uncertainty, as po was pointed out by Ms. Erickson, in certain components of the bycatch estimates, overall, I think we can be pretty confident that there have been some meaningful reductions in bycatch over this time period. Now, I'm going to... Um, Discuss for a second the, the, the concept and use of biological regions. You're probably getting used to these by now because it's been a couple of years that we've been presenting data at the level of biological regions. And in fact, if uh, I don't think anybody here was probably around uh, back in the 1960s, uh, but in fact, we used to reflect all of our data in, in this same concept um, of biological regions. Region two, region three, region four, and region four B um, historically, this is the, the level that the data was collected and reported at. And this is something that uh, in, in response to a request by the commissioners two years ago now to investigate um, bio the biological basis for how we were determining stock trend and stock distribution, uh, the staff undertook a, an effort to better understand what, what we know about the current dynamics of the Pacific halibut stock. And we've learned a lot over the last decade. In addition to the expansions that we've done to our set line survey, as you'll hear from my colleague, Dr. Planas later on, our research program has also learned a considerable amount about the movements of Pacific halibut. And our, our broad understanding hasn't changed so much, which is that ju juvenile young halibut, less than five or six years old, move extensively across the stock. We can tag them nearly anywhere in the range and recover them nearly anywhere else including from the Bering Sea Flats all the way down to Oregon. Over the lifetime of those fish, these, these fish are moving generally to the east and to the south. And we see fish that were tagged as two and three-year-olds in the Bering Sea showing up in, in increasing numbers in the Gulf and in southeast Alaska and down into British Columbia and even the lower 48, six to eight years later. But what has improved our, what, what, what has emerged in our understanding of the stock is that there's an additional movement going on with spawning migrations each year. And these spawning migrations are mixing fish across, certainly across IPHC regulatory areas, and even in some cases, potentially across these biological regions. And what this means is that within a calendar year, we can have fish that we may have measured with the set line survey in one place, actually spawning at the far end of that, that biological region. And in fact, passing through multiple IPHC regulatory areas, even during the single fishing season. And so that's why you're seeing an increasing emphasis on these biological regions as a more meaningful unit at which to describe the stock. We also see systematic differences in the biology across these regions. In the east, we tend to see younger, more fast growing fish. In the west, particularly region 4B is where we see the oldest fish in the stock. And we also see fish that take a very long time to get there. So if you told me you, you just caught a fish that was 50 years old, I'd say, well, you were probably in 4B. But if you said you caught 180 pound halibut and it was only 15 years old, well, that was probably region two. So I'm gonna be um, describing many of the data sources in the context of these biological regions. And I wanna start with a figure that you didn't see at the interim meeting, uh, which is a reflection of the commercial, the historical commercial landings divided into these biological regions. And what you can see from this figure is that the Pacific halibut stock and the yield available from it has been highly dynamic over the last hundred years. 
Note that the x-axis does go all the way back to 1900. And we've seen huge swings in, in the amount of yield available from the Pacific halibut stock, as well as where that yield is, has been available. We began in the early part of the 1900s with a huge amount of yield coming out of region two at a time when there was very little fishing to the west and to the north of that, that region. We then saw an increasing amount of catch coming from region three. And then we see this period from there up until the present day with great swings in the amount of yield available um, rel in relative sense between region two and region three. And I think this kind of dynamic nature of the stock is something that we should expect to see in the future as well. Now, before I get into uh, recap the trend information from the survey and from the commercial fisheries, I want to give you a little, um, essentially a, a translator for trying to understand how we, we may or may not see different trends in different sources of data. So if you imagine that this is the age of a particular fish or a particular cohort of fish moving through the Pacific halibut stock, we're gonna see these fish at different ages for, with different data sources. And so for example, the spawning biomass, when we measure spawning biomass, and I provide you with a time series of spawning biomass estimates from the stock assessment, that's gonna reflect fish that are largely age 11 or 12 and older. Because that's when 11 and a half is when roughly 50% of Pacific halibut are mature. Now, the, the commercial fishery is actually accessing these fish starting around age eight. So the landings are going to be comprised primarily of fish eight years old to roughly 15 or 16 years old, but also including some fish older than that. So the trends that we see in the commercial fishery are going to lead those that we see in the, in the spawning biomass estimates by a few years. Then the set line survey, as you heard in the presentations uh, preceding mine, the set line survey includes fish as small as we can catch with 16 aught circle hooks, which means down to roughly age five or six. We catch a few age four fish as well, but not many. So that means that the trends that we see in the set line survey are also gonna lead those we see in the commercial fishery by several years, because we are able to index those fish that in some degree are being captured by the commercial fishery, but are not being landed. So we don't see those in the, in the trends of logbook landings. We don't see them in the biological samples that occur in the ports. And finally, when we talk about fishing intensity and we look at the measures of fishing intensity, we're using SPR, the spawning potential ratio, as a measure of how hard are we fishing the stock. Well, that's going to include the effects on fish all the way down to those that are captured in some of the non-halibut fisheries as well as in the recreational fishery, which extend all the way down to age two. So when we see things that, that may look, uh, we, may, we may see a trend that looks a little different in the fishing intensity compared to say the set line survey or the commercial fishery, it's because it's reflecting a different age range of fish that are contributing to that particular index or that particular data source. So hopefully this will provide you with a bit of a key as we go through to be able to compare among the various indices um, and data sources that I'm gonna show you. Now, you've seen this figure already. This is the, the modeled survey trend that my colleague, Dr. Webster showed you just a minute ago. And I'm not going to go into the level of detail that, that he provided in the individual components. What I want to point out here is that this is the primary index that's going into the stock assessment each year. Um, our, our catch in the, on the set line survey is in numbers of fish, and we model it as such in the survey, uh, in, the, in the stock assessment, in numbers of fish. We also keep track of the size of those fish, and so there's a conversion from numbers to weight, um, but we're using the data essentially in its rawest form by putting it into the um, stock assessment in terms of numbers. Now, the results, you can, as you can see, 2017 and 18, across all the top three panels and indeed at the coastwide level, 2017 and 18 were much lower than the, the, the years leading up to that. So we, in 2017, there was some question um, among, by, by many people of whether that decrease that we saw from 2016 to 2017, well, how much of that's actually a change in the stock in the water and how much of that could be attributable to measurement error? So we, we've seen these, these uh, shaded bands indicate our degree of certainty. And you know, certainly um, the, uh, the, the drop that we saw from 16 to 17, well, some of that could have been explained just by the noise in the data, our uncertainty in, in the estimates. But I think now that we've seen an additional year added onto that, we can see that those, those decreases that we saw in 2017 were actually part of the process um, and not just our, our process of observation. There's actually a change in the stock. And so we now have a second year's data point to corroborate that. 
I will note that area 4, 4B, region 4B in the bottom left-hand panel here, is the one area that didn't show quite the same trend. Uh, 2017 and 2018 are both lower than the preceding years, uh, but 2018 is actually slightly higher than 2017. As you'll see in a few slides, though, region 4B represents a very small component in the overall stock. And so focusing your attention on the center bottom panel there at the coastwide level, we're now down to the lowest numbers of halibut estimated in our set line survey that we've seen since the early 1990s, which unfortunately is as far back as we can go with the, with the survey data that we have in hand. Now that's the trend in numbers. Moving now into weight per unit effort, again, you just saw this, this figure from my colleague, Dr. Webster. You see that these patterns are not so pronounced when we get to the weight per unit effort, and that's twofold. One, because uh, this is 032 weight per unit effort, so you're not seeing the effect of the numbers of those sublegal fish that we're only detecting with the set line survey. And secondly, you're also seeing the trend in numbers being slightly offset by the growth of the cohorts that we have in the water. So we have a relatively strong 2005 cohort, and as it gets older, those fish continue to grow and they're adding biomass. So we can be losing numbers and actually adding biomass at the same time. That, that, that is consistent to see those, those two things happening. And that's why you see somewhat um, less pronounced trends in 032 weight per unit effort than you see in the numbers per unit effort. However, across regions two, three, and four, you see still here a decrease um, in, in, from 2015 and 16 through 2017 and 2018. And, and again, um, same pattern at the coastwide level. Now, this figure, it, rather than go through individually each of the regulatory areas and provide, as I did at the interim meeting, the comparison between the survey 032 and the commercial catch rates, I wanted to give you a slightly different perspective. You can find all those same figures in document eight if you'd like to look through those and review the, the specific percentages by regulatory area. This figure gives you a slightly different percentage. This is the commercial catch rates that we've seen across each of the regulatory areas. The black line down the middle reflects the coastwide aggregate and you can see that that mirrored, mirrored the survey quite well from the early 2000s through sometime around 2010 to 12 uh, with that long period of decrease. And then since then, it's been somewhat variable with a decrease from 2017 to 2018. So here's where we're starting to see a slight difference in those trends where we didn't see a, a decrease in the commercial catch rates at the coastwide level from 16 to 17, but now we are starting to see it from 2017 to 2018. And I'm not going to take the time to go into each of the regulatory areas, but I wanted to note for several of the areas at the top of this graph you see here, and these are all plotted on the same scale, so you can also get a sense of the relative catch rates among the regulatory areas. Areas 2B, 3A, and 2C are the top three, the red, the blue, and the red above the black line there. You see that all of those um, areas, our top performing regulatory areas, have all seen a decrease in the last couple of years in commercial catch per unit effort. Now the next result that we get um, from the set line survey that uh, Dr. Webster didn't, didn't discuss is our, it, it serves as our primary tool for estimating the biological stock distribution. So we can look at our catch rates and, we can, and given the distribution of stations across all the various habitat types and depth zones in each of these biological regions, it provides us with a relative estimate of how the stock is distributed across these regions. So if I show you a time series now, this is beginning in 1993, and the height of the bar reflects the percent of the stock in each of these biological regions in that particular year. So each of these bar charts goes from 1993 through 2018. You can very quickly see, and, and it's on purpose that there are no there's no scale on here because I just want you to get a general sense of how the stock is distributed. I'll show you the specific numbers in a second. You can see quite clearly that region three serves as the core of the Pacific halibut stock. It's always provided around 50% or more of the overall biomass that supports the, the coastwide stock. And however, you can see that region three has come down in previous decades, there was a higher level of biomass in Region 3, and over the last uh, decade and a half, you've seen a slow decrease in the amount of, um, in the proportion of the overall stock that's occurring in Region 3. Conversely, in Region 2, you can see an increase. As the, as the proportion of the stock shifted out of Region 3, you've seen it increase in Region 2. 
can also see a slight increase in region four, and you can see the relative contribution in the bottom left there of region 4B in the Aleutian Islands to the overall stock. Now, if we zoom in on the most recent five years, and I'll actually show you the, the specific percentages associated with each of those um, bar charts. And again, you can see region three comprising in recent years around 50% of the stock, uh, region four around 20%, region two around 23.1%, uh, ranging from a high of 24.6 to this estimate in 2018, and region 4B in the range of 4 to 5% of our overall stock. Now, I'll note that this time series here reflects the updated information that we have now after five years of our survey expansion. So these, these estimates of stock distribution are not the same as they were five years ago. And Dr. Webster made this point, but I want to, I want to make it again that we've learned a lot over the last five years. We had an excellent survey design going into this expansion, but there were broad swaths of the coast that we had never set foot in or never driven a boat in, in uh, as part of the set line survey. And we will now, as of 2019, we will have filled in all of these gaps and we will have essentially fished all of the stations across the entire range of Pacific halibut, at least in US and Canadian waters, uh, that we're capable of fishing with our current survey design. So we have learned a substantial amount over the last six years. And that's reflected in these estimates of, of current stock distribution. I'm going to move now into the biological characteristics of the stock. Um, and this slide is a transition into the biology because it's not showing you just biology. It's also showing you fishery behavior. So this, this slide shows you the trends that we've observed at the docks in each of these regulatory areas. And I've actually aggregated um, region four here together um, just for, for clarity. But this, this figure shows you the average size of fish that's hit the dock over the last several decades. And as you can see on this figure, the black line down the middle is the coastwide average. And you can see that that was decreasing pretty substantially from the late 90s through somewhere around 2010. And since then, the average size fish has stayed pretty stable between 20 and 25 pounds. And you can also see in this figure um, that we've seen some shifts in how the, the, how the average size fish has changed between different individual regulatory areas. So the two blue lines reflect region three, three regulatory areas 3A and 3B. And those were pretty close to the coastwide average in the early part of this time series and have since dropped somewhat. Um, and at the end of this time series, 3A in particular is now substantially below the coastwide average. Area 2C, the red triangles at the top of this figure, the fishery in area 2C consistently lands the largest fish on the coast and has for several decades. Um, and that, that, that trend has been consistent all the way back into the early 2000s. Now, I said this is a transition slide because this reflects not only the fish that are available, but also the fishing practices that are going on in each of these regulatory areas. And so where, where the fishery is operating, when it's operating, um, and how it's operating, whether it's, it's targeting big fish or targeting higher catch rates of smaller fish can all affect this stock. So my next slide here shows you the average weight of a Pacific halibut captured on our IPHC set line survey. Now this really does just reflect biology because our survey is, is standardized. We're using the same gear at the same stations over this, this time period. And um, so this, this, in fact, is now reflecting the trends in the biology. And you can see that same overall decrease from the late 1990s through somewhere around 2010. And you do see some similarities to the previous slide in that you see region two all showing some of the larger fish on the coast. Interestingly, those fish are not the oldest fish. Those tend to be fat, relatively fast growing younger fish. You can, you can also see um, regions 3A and particularly region 3B is, has consistently been um, producing on our, for our set line survey, the smallest fish on the coast. And this is a reflective, a reflective of a much higher level of encounters with sublegal halibut in um, regulatory area 3B on our set line survey. Moving now into the age information. So there's a lot of circles on this plot. Let me take a second here to, to introduce you to how this plot is laid out. The y-axis is the age of a Pacific halibut, and the x-axis is year. And each of those circles represents the proportion of the fishery catch in number that was that age in that year. And so these, the, the diagonal patterns you see, particularly in the early part of that time series, reflect strong cohorts. A big circle 
as it moves forward in time is going to get one year, one year older. And so that's going to create a diagonal banding pattern in this figure. A couple things are, are present in this figure. At the end of this time series, you see that the largest circle is the 2005 year class. Now, actually, be, before I even be, introduce the 2005 year class, you may be looking at this figure and saying, well, actually, it looks pretty stable to me. There's a lot of circles across a lot of ages. And in fact, that's fairly characteristic of the Pacific halibut fishery and the Pacific halibut stock, which is that we have had a relatively stable age structure across nearly 100 years of this fishery now. Even back into the early part of last century, the Pacific halibut fishery has accessed halibut that are between 8 and around 15 years old. Those have been standard fish in this fishery for around 100 years. And that's actually a good thing. Stability in the age structure of the catch and in, indeed in the age structure of the population is a good thing. In the current years, what we're seeing is that the strongest year class is that 2005 year class. And you'll see in a second that that translates as well into the, the survey information. And you can trace that 2005 year class back through time. You can see some larger circles moving down and to the left in this, in this um, figure illustrating that, that 2005 year class moving through this time series. The other thing I'd like you to note on this figure is what I've mentioned several times now is that the, the fishery does not land fish younger than about age eight very frequently. So you'll see there's occasionally we get a five-year-old, there's a few six-year-olds and seven-year-olds, but primarily these fish are eight years old and up that are being landed, that are, that are graduating above that minimum size limit and entering the, the landed catch. The fishery is certainly handling some of those smaller fish, but we're not able to sample those in port. If we move now to the set line survey, you can see that this figure is very similar to the one I just showed you. You also see that 2005 year class, but you also see an additional amount of fish down there below age eight. So we're still not catching a lot of fish less than age eight, but we're catching and, and observing and sampling more of those fish than we, than we have access to from the commercial fishery. What's also of note is these two dots at the end of the time series. These reflect the six and seven year old fish, which in 2018, that would have been the 2011 and 2012 year class. And you can see if you look back through time, that's a pretty good showing for six and seven year olds. That's about as, as many six and seven year olds as we've seen since the mid 2000s, when we actually had some decent recruitments coming in from the 1990s. And this is a, the, one of the more important sources of information coming into this year's stock assessment which is that this is our first look at um, a couple of year classes, 2011 and 12, that look better than the ones leading up to them. I'll speak to the, our, our estimates of recruitment a little more when I get to the modeling results here in a few minutes. Um, but this is going to have an effect on our, on our results. The last, um, the last comments I want to make about data sources are with regard to the overall conditions in the ecosystem, in the, both in the Gulf of Alaska and in the Bering Sea and off the west coast of uh, Canada and the United States. In the last several years, we've seen some very anomalous conditions in the ecosystem across all of these areas. It's been a little bit different on the West Coast and in Canada and in the Gulf as you move up into the Bering Sea. The specific issues are different, but the overall story is the same, which is that since around 2014, we've seen conditions that were not very predictable. And, and honestly, the people that study the environment in the Northeast Pacific are having a very difficult time explaining what these what the potential effects of these conditions might be on the ecosystem itself. In, uh, to, in the fall of 2018, leading up, le lasting almost to the interim meeting this year, we had continued warm water. Generally, that warm water that would disappear at the end of the summer persisted into the Gulf of Alaska. This image is from October, showing a very strong positive uh, temperature anomaly extending into the Gulf of Alaska, even in October, which was very unseasonable. Now, that actually did abate after the interim meeting, and we're back to, as I understand, slightly more normal conditions uh, moving into this winter. However, we're coming off a winter, the winter of 2017 and 18, which was very different than anything that had been seen in a very long time. In the northern Bering Sea, there was essentially no sea ice in the winter of 2017 and 18. And uh, that, the, that translated into a very different environment the subsequent spring and summer. The cold pool that's generally um, created by the ice cover was completely absent in the summer of 2018. And so not only on our IPHC set line survey, but on the NIPS trawl surveys that occurred in the Bering Sea, we saw um, 
a, sh a shift in water temperatures much warmer in the northern parts of the Bering Sea flats and even up into the northern Bering Sea than it had been seen previously. Now, some species really followed those, those trends. Pacific cod, over half of the biomass occurred north of the normal survey zone in the Bering Sea. Halibut were not so pronounced, but we did see around a 20% increase in the density of Pacific halibut north of the normal uh, Bering Sea trawl survey grid. Now, as my colleague Dr. Webster mentioned, we were lucky to have that northern expansion of the um, Bering Sea trawl survey, which we use in the, in the space-time model. So, in fact, the results that I've shown you and, and you saw from Dr. Webster reflect all of that information that was collected all the way up through the northern Bering Sea. So our estimates of Pacific halibut density and distribution reflect that, that information that is available from those northern areas, but it is a fairly new phenomenon to see those fish that far north. Uh, finally, there were, there were other things going on in that area. There were bird mortalities and other things that are likely indicative of shifts in the, in the prey species and in, in other um, species that may have more delayed effects, um, potentially positive but possibly negative as well, on the Pacific halibut stock in years to come. You probably recall that we use a, a metric of the environmental conditions as a covariate in the annual stock assessment. Uh, years ago, it was discovered that the Pacific Decadal Oscillation, which is just, just a metric of um, overall productivity in the Northeast Pacific Ocean, that years ago it was discovered that that was a, a correlated with the level of incoming recruitments to the Pacific halibut stock. So in a nutshell, when these points were above the line, when they were pos in a positive phase of the PDO, we tended to see, on average, better Pacific halibut recruitment than when they were below that line in a negative phase. And we don't know why this is. Uh, we don't have a mechanistic explanation for this. A at this point, it, it remains a correlation. However, there are some plausible hypotheses about how this might be related. In a positive phase, the current pattern in the Gulf of Alaska tends to move north and to the west, which is the right direction for Pacific halibut larvae to get to the nursery areas. In addition, the water tends to be a little warmer, which also could be producing more productivity and more food for um, both pelagic, juvenile, and um, young halibut in the water column. However, at this point, we still don't fully understand the mechanisms. What I do want to point out is that we've, we've just had a period from 2014 to 18 where we did have a positive anomaly in the Pacific Decadal Oscillation, which might be indicative of better Pacific halibut recruitment. Unfortunately, we don't know because these fish, although they've been in the water now for um, several years, we, we have yet to sample them with our sampling tools. And we, as I, I mentioned earlier, um, five years old is about the minimum age that we see for halibut in the set line survey. And so these 2014 year class, we'll see this coming summer. We haven't yet seen them. Perhaps more relevant to our, our considerations this year is this previous period from 2007 to 2013, which was actually a, a negative phase in the Pacific Decadal Oscillation. And so on average, we would expect that that's probably correlated with below average um, halibut recruitment. However, as I'll show you, it's hard to say. Um, this, this index is not a good predictor of a specific year's recruitment, but it is, tend, does tend to be useful over a longer time period to describe changes in the average. Luckily, we do have some additional information for this period from 7 to 13 coming through our set line survey and even a little bit from the commercial fishery, and that's what's informing our current recruitment estimates for that time period. So that brings me to the end of my summary of the data sources, and now I'll move into the modeling efforts for this year. So for 2018, we've not made any changes to the basic assessment methodology that we've been using for several years now. Uh, this, this assessment in 20, the 2018 assessment, projecting into 2019, is an updated assessment. So we're using the same four models, an ensemble of models, to be able to describe different structural hypotheses about how the stock works. And this, this ensemble of models and the methods used to construct these models was last fully reviewed in 2015. We're looking forward to another full review in 2019 where we will be able to go in and, and reinvestigate some of the, um, uh, mechanical, the mechanics of these models and see if there are improvements that could possibly be made. Uh, but for this year, the, the differences that you see in the results from last year to this year reflect new data. They're not, they're not reflective of changes in the models because we haven't made changes to the model structures um, in, in the last several years. So the new information, the, the key pieces of information that are coming into this year's analysis are coming from the terminal year in the time series. So we have the 2018 fishery data 
and the modeled survey trend that you've just, just seen now a couple of times. We have the biological data that was collected in 2018, ages, lengths, and weights coming from the commercial fishery as well as the set line survey. And it's important to note here that this is a, essentially a real-time assessment. So the, the 2018 fishery and the 2018 survey were both sampled, the ages were read from those two sources, and we have that information available to us. So that gives us a whole nother year's look into the stock dynamics than we would have if we were going to be have to wait on those data, as many stock assessments have to do um, until the following year to actually get the biological information. And finally, as you've heard now in two presentations, this, the, um, the FISS or Setline Survey Expansion in Region 2 not only updated the values for 2018, but it updated the full modeled survey time series. And I, I can't understate enough how much we've learned over the last five years as we have sequentially picked off each of these expansions. We're now down to just one more um, region to, to complete this survey expansion. So here's the results from this year. This, this figure shows you the blue bands are the results from this year's uh, stock assessment model. There's a dark blue line down the center that represents the median value or our best estimate of the time series over the last several decades. The black lines, each one of which ends in a red dot, are the assessments that have been produced since, um, well, actually the very first red dot there was the one seven years ago in this room. And then moving forward each year, each assessment result is another red dot at the end of that time series. And so you can see that the results that we have from this year's stock assessment are very consistent with what we've seen over the last seven stock assessments. We had the spawning biomass decreasing rapidly over that period from the late 1990s through around 2010. The stock flattened out. We've had some stability over this, the most recent seven or eight years since then. We actually had some stock increase going on from 2013, 14, and 15, a very gradual increase in the spawning biomass. And that turned the corner sometime around 2015 or 16, and now we're seeing a gradual decrease again leaving us at a stock level that, a spawning biomass level that's actually been relatively flat over this time period over the last seven years. The projection for uh, the beginning of 2019 just slightly below the points from 2018, 17, and 16. Now, th that's the result in aggregate for the entire stock assessment, but there were some specific changes in the individual model results. And I'm not gonna go into those in quite the same detail I did in the interim meeting, but I want to point, point you to the, um, the causes of those changes. And, I, and the documents, particularly document nine, will show you some sensitivity analysis if you want to see exactly how the model trends changed in response to these two data sources. The expansion data in region two served to pull all of the spawning biomass estimates up in all of these, um, or in two of the, the four stock assessment models. So let me, let me say that again, because it's a little confusing. We're still estimating that the stock is decreasing but the overall scale of those estimates has increased slightly. So that's an important distinction because what it means is that when, you, when we get to the, the mortality tables and the decision table, it looks as though there's a little bit more yield available this year. And it's hard to, to maybe understand why, how could there be a little bit more yield available for the same fish intensity if you're saying the stock is decreasing? It's because the entire scale has come up slightly. That trend of decreasing spawning biomass is actually very similar to what we've seen in recent years. Second, the 2018 survey data, as I just showed you a few minutes ago, um, showed an increase in the values observed um, at ages six and seven, which correspond to the 2011 and 2012 recruitment estimates. And we have very little other information in the stock assessment model to tell us about these incoming recruitments. So the response in the assessment model is to increase the estimates of recruitments for those years. Now, these are better than electronic fish because they're being informed specifically by data. However, we've only seen those recruitments once. And so the upcoming year's data, seeing them again in 2019 and hopefully again in 2020, will be very important as we move forward. Nonetheless, those, that, that ver those first observations of those uh, recruitment events had a strong effect on this year's stock assessment results. So breaking down the overall result, here are the results from each of the four stock assessment models. And you can see there's a pretty broad spread at the end of this time series. All of these models are projecting that 2018 and 2019 are a little bit lower than 2017 and 2016, but the magnitude of that decrease varies a little bit. And the absolute magnitude of the stock is actually a pretty broad distribution in, in 20, at the beginning of 2019. 
in a nutshell, we're not sure exactly how many halibut are out there, but we're pretty sure that the stock is declining slightly over the last couple of years. Now, these are the, the time series of recent recruitment estimates from each of the four stock assessment models. And at first glance, this might just look like a mess, but there's actually some pretty clear signal in here. And so let me, let me walk you through. Each of these lines represents the recruitment time series from an individual stock assessment model. The scale of each of the time series differs because there are different assumptions in that model. Some of these models assume that there's a very high level of natural mortality relative to others, and so you have to have more fish to get through that mortality. And so that's why there's a there's difference on the scale here. But if you look at the relative pattern, you can see that 1999 is a relatively good year across all four of these time series. 2005 is a relatively good year across all these time series, and the years in between are not bad. What you can also see is that 2006 through 2010 are pretty much some of the lowest values in any of these time series. If you pick a color and trace it across, I guarantee that the two values from 2006 to 2010 will be pretty near the lowest in the time series. And that means that regardless of our assumption about natural mortality or the scale of these recruitments, we're, what we're seeing is that the estimates have, are, have been lower for 2006 to 2010. And you also see some increase there in 2011 and 12 relative to that, that previous five-year period, and that's being informed by the data that we saw in 2018. Now, this is important because here's where we were in the 2018 fishery. The 2018 fishery is catching fish all the way up to and including the 2010 year class, but still largely focused on those fish occurring um, up, up to and including the 2005 year class. So that 2005 year class continued to create some stability in the fishery. But as we move forward, we're gonna be moving into this gap from 2006 to 2010. So if we look forward to 2019, now we're looking all the way across that gap. And as the, the importance of that 2005 year, year class decreases, we're gonna be increasingly relying on these cohorts, which are estimated to be very small from 2006 to 2010. So it's gonna be quite important moving forward over the next couple of years, what we see with regard to that 2011 and 2012 year class. Again, we will get another look at those and they, they should start to show up in the fishery data starting in 2019 and, and again in 2020. So not only next year will we get another survey data point, but we'll also get another observation, hopefully directly from the commercial fishery as those fish start to graduate into the landed catch. So the recruitment dynamics over the next several years are gonna be one of the most important components that we have to deal with in the, in the population dynamics of this stock. I didn't speak back in the data section much about size at age, but size at age, generally came down through around 2010. It's been somewhat variable with really no clear trend uh, since around 2010. You can go into document eight and see lots of figures. We actually have an interactive tool on the website now to explore size at age as well as observed in our set line survey. But really the thing to focus on in the next several years is gonna be recruitment. And unfortunately we have a pretty well established gap that's coming. This 2006 to 10 year classes are gonna be what drive the stock over the next several years. Now here's another look at the trends. This is the age eight plus biomass predicted from each of the, the stock assessment models. And this is gonna be something that corresponds roughly to what's available to the commercial fisheries. So remember I showed you just a couple slides ago a spawning biomass trend, which had been relatively flat for a few years and then was starting to decrease. Well, you see a similar pattern here, although a little bit more decline over the last several years in the eight, eight plus biomass. So this is leading a little bit the trends that we're seeing in the spawning biomass because it's picking up fish that are eight, nine and 10 years old, which haven't gotten there yet. So a little bit longer decrease in this time series and maybe a little bit closer to what we're seeing in the actual fishery performance over the last several years, at least at the coastwide level. Finally, I wanna to touch on our estimates of fishing intensity and we're measuring this based on the spawning potential ratio, which I, as I indicated earlier, represents the, the, um, the effect of fishing on all fish throughout the whole age range. So from age two right on up through all, all the way to the end of the age range. And so the spawning potential ratio reflects the effect on the lifetime contribution of those fish. So it accounts for the fact that if you catch a fish when it's three years old, you've cut off more of its lifetime contribution than if you caught that fish when it was 20 years old, it's already spawned a bunch of times and it really doesn't have as much of a contribution left to make. 
So this is the time series. I'm going to take you back a couple of years and, and play this forward so you can see how this, how our estimates and how our understanding of fishing intensity have evolved over the last several years. So these were the results as of the 2016 assessment. So two assessments ago, um, this was our time series of fishing intensity. The x-axis here is SPR, but it's going from zero at the top to uh, a larger number at the bottom. All you need to know is that the higher that line is, the higher the level of fishing intensity. So what you see here is that we had a fairly high level of fishing intensity. We brought that down in the late 2000s through somewhere around 2014 or 15, and that was in response to the large cuts that were made in the overall levels of mortality in that time period. And then it was relatively flat in that time period from 2014 to 2017. And that's when we made this concept of the reference level. So that the orange bar across the middle there shows you a reference SPR of 46%. And it's not a magic number. It's just the average of those three years at the end of this time series, 2014, 2015, and 2016. As you'll recall, this was a transition between um, the blue line and some new still emerging uh, management procedure that's still under development. And so what we wanted to provide was a point of reference, a place, a level of fishing intensity that we could compare to across years to see, well, did we go up or did we go down relative to this reference level and give us some way to track things over time. So that's where the reference level came from. It's merely just the average of those last three, three points. Now, the 2016 assessment also made a projection. So we knew what the catch limits were that had been set and we projected, and that's this, this dash line out to that last point there. So we made a projection that the fishing intensity would increase based on the catch levels or the mortality levels that were set for 2017. So then we went away for a year and we came back and we produced the 2017 stock assessment. And we got slightly different estimates of fishing intensity. So in the 2017, stock assessment, we estimated, well, actually the fishing intensity was a little higher than we thought in previous years, but actually we were right about the projection in that it did go up. So the, the, the fishing intensity did increase from 2016 to 17 based on the catch limits that had been set. But now we estimate actually we were a little bit above that reference level um, in that period from 2014 through 2016. So that was the result of the 2017 assessment. Again, we made a projection for 2018 based on the catch limits that were set in 2017. And then we did the 2018 assessment. And the results in 2018 you see here is this blue line. So now, well now we're actually estimating that the, the fishing intensity is just slightly lower than it was in 2016, a bit lower than it was in 2017. But again, we, we're still in agreement that the fishing intensity went down a little bit from 2017 to 2018. Okay, so that's the three-year recap. Well, you're probably looking at that going, well, that's kind of a lot of variability around that reference level. It's a little frustrating if we're setting a, a, a catch limit and we think we're gonna get, in, for example, this, this most recent one, we think we're gonna get something around F41. And in fact, we get something that we're now estimating is more like an F48. Well, yeah, it is a fair bit of variability, but here are the, here's the uncertainty that we have in those estimates. And you can see that the level of precision at which we can estimate these quantities is much more broad than this level of variability year to year. Now, I'd love to be able to tell you that there's a magic piece of data coming and we're gonna be able to refine these estimates and somehow we won't have this problem in the future. But in fact, this is the level of uncertainty that we have to deal with in the dynamics of the Pacific halibut stock. And so what does this mean moving forward? Well. The variability in these recent estimates of fishing intensity is likely to continue into the future. However, we do have several tools to address this level of variability. The first you'll hear more about tomorrow with regard to the management strategy evaluation process. My colleague, uh, Dr. Alan Hicks, will discuss the strategic approach to this, which is that the management procedures that he's evaluating are robust to this estimation uncertainty. So when he does simulations to see what's a good policy to take, he's testing that policy knowing full well and modeling in those simulations that we're gonna have this kind of variability. So we might shoot for F41, we might get F48. We might shoot for F48, we might get F41. So the performance you'll see him present reflects this kind of uncertainty. He's tuned that, those simulations to match what we have to deal with in the stock assessment. The second piece, the second tool we have to deal with this is the harvest decision table. And when we get there, I will show you how to address this kind of uncertainty right in the harvest decision table through using the probabilities 
that reflect this, this range of uncertainty that we have in current fishing intensity. So I'll, I'll, I'll bring that back up in a couple of slides, but I want to put a placeholder for that here. So finally, to recap the 2018 results, we've seen a somewhat of an increase in both the scale and the, the trend uncertainty. So we have, we're, we're less certain about exactly how many halibut are in the water. We're not exactly sure ex what the trend is, although all the models are projecting this slow decrease in spawning biomass. The key pieces of information are these. In 2019, next year, or this coming year, we'll be getting two key pieces of information. The first is that we'll finish the, spawn, the set line survey expansion. This is gonna be important because we can stop seeing a new time series every year after this. As Dr. Webster pointed out, every time we look in a new area, we're learning something fundamental about the Pacific halibut stock. Moving forward, we're gonna be learning something about the, the terminal year of this, the time series, but much less about the rest of the time series. So that's, I think that's gonna be helpful for everybody to not have to be worried about how the whole time series is gonna change and more worried about just what's, how, how is the biomass changing from year to year moving forward. We will essentially, after a couple of decades, finally filled in all of the, the gaps in the, the set line survey. The second piece of key information is these six and seven year old fish. They don't represent a big part of the survey catch. And so another year's data is gonna provide the information that we need to, to, to update these estimates. Hopefully we will start to see them in the commercial fishery. Definitely we will see them again in the set line survey. Whether they turn out to be a strong or a weak year class, these data are gonna be crucial in 2019. To summarize the, the stock assessment results with regard to our management procedures, with regard to uh, historical harvest policy, uh, we provide this table and this, this table was available also at the interim meeting as a, as a summary of all these various metrics. We divide these metrics up into metrics relating to mortality in the top row, the level of fishing intensity in the second row, the spawning biomass in the third row, and finally the biological stock distribution in the fourth row. I'm not gonna go through in detail all of these individual pieces, but I do wanna call out a couple of highlights. Uh, the first is that we do estimate that the fishing intensity decreased from 2017 to 18. So the reductions that were made last year by both nations to, to set lower catch limits did result in a lower level of fishing intensity, despite our uncertainty in the magnitude of that overall. However, we do estimate that the spawning biomass did still decrease from 2017 to 2018. So even though we brought the fishing intensity and the catch down, spawning biomass is still going down. And that's gonna probably continue in response to these recruitments moving into the stock. A couple other things I'll note on this figure, the relative spawning biomass currently, or the, the spawning biomass at the beginning of 2019 relative to some averaged unfished level is at 43%, which is pretty close to where targets are for most ground fish species. So the biomass is not necessarily in a, in a bad place, but we do note that it is projected to go down under a pretty broad level of catch ranges. Secondarily, where are we with regard to our trigger our, in our current um, interim management procedure? We have this trigger point at spawning biomass of 30%. We dip below that, the interim management procedure suggests we should start reducing the level of fishing intensity. We currently estimate there's only an 11% chance that we're below that level. So despite the broad uncertainty we have in the stock size, we're pretty sure we're above that trigger, at least now. Although as you'll see when we get to the decision table, we're gonna be drifting down closer and closer to that trigger over the next several years under a pretty broad range of catch levels. That brings me now into the projections and the decision table. And i uh, start with the projections just with some, some graphics to show you the relative spawning biomass trend over the next several years at different levels of projections. And I provide one which is no fishing mortality whatsoever, just, just as an indication of how fast the stock could respond in the absence of any fishing mortality. And you'll see that in, in this case, the stock can increase, it might increase by a few percent over the next several years. But this is essentially the maximum rate at which we could expect the stock to increase given the recruitments that are already in the pipeline and the current size at age. And you know, to be honest, this is not a very rapid rate of increase. We're not dealing with salmon or herring or something that can show a wide swing in biomass. Even if we stop fishing completely, this is about the best we could do from the Pacific halibut stock. As we start to increase that fishing, you'll see this trend start to change. So at 20 million pounds of TCEY, that's essentially the break even point. 
So at 20 million pounds, we have almost a 50-50 chance of being exactly where we are now in three years. So that's, a, that's one metric of the amount of surplus production that's available over the next three years. As we start to bring that up, the status quo or the catch limits that were adopted um, last year to 37.2 million pounds, you see we start to see a decrease in the spawning biomass over the next three years. If we were to go up to that reference level of F46% at 40 million pounds, that decrease becomes a little more pronounced. And then finally, if we went to much larger harvest levels than we've seen in, in recent years, up to 60 million pounds, you see that we're starting to get a fairly steep decline in spawning biomass. So as we, as we exceed that 20 million pound range, we're starting to tap into the, the spawning biomass and the, the, not just the yield available, but the standing stock. And we start to see a decrease over the next three years in yield and in spawning biomass. So finally, it brings us to the decision table, which is the primary tool for evaluating all these results that I've shown you in the context of benefits or yield in the next few years against the potential risk of something bad happening. The benefits are all described in terms of total mortality across the top, all sizes, the TCEY, or uh, generally the O26 mortality, not including U26 bycatch, the level of fishing intensity that we would anticipate uh, would be associated with that, noting that below there is the range of fishing intensity reflecting those broad confidence intervals I showed you, um, and the fact that we might set a catch and think we're going to get on at with 50% chance a level of fishing intensity, but it could actually be substantially larger or smaller than that level of fishing intensity. So each of those alternatives is then um, compared against the risk of something bad happening. And we divide this table into three sections. There's some extreme values on either end to provide some contrast, and that's what I just showed you in those figures. And then across the middle are a, a more a finer grid of alternatives intended to provide uh, hopefully enough resolution for uh, the decisions that will be made this week and the discussions that will occur about um, harvest levels. So I'm going to go through now not the whole table but just each piece in, in sequence. The top block of the harvest decision table reflects the probability of decreases in stock trend. And I realize from the back of the room these are probably impossible to read. These are going to be in docu at the, towards the end of document nine if you want to read the individual values, but I'll give you the highlights as I go along. So I can highlight that entire center block and I can tell you what I just told you, which is that there's a relatively high probability of stock decline for all TCEYs larger than around 20 million pounds. And that's going to apply either one year in the future or up to three years in the future. Those probabilities increase with increasing um, mortality on the stock. So from left to right, the mortality increases and the probability of stock decline increases. And as you get down to levels of fishing intensity around F40%, which is the far right-hand section of that block that's outlined in red, you see that most of those probabilities are in the 90 plus percent range, indicating we're pretty sure that the stock will go down, the spawning biomass will go down under that level of fishing intensity. The next block, down in the decision table shows you probabilities associated with stock status. So these are the probabilities of going below that fishery trigger at SB 30% and below that fishery limit where we would suggest that fishing intensity needs to be dropped to zero at SB 20%. And you can see that these probabilities are much lower, reflecting our starting point, which is that we're not yet near that trigger. However, they do increase from left to right. And as you can see, at the reference level of 46%, in one year, we basically have about a one out of five chance that we dip below that 30% trigger. Moving out to two years, that increases to a one in four chance. And moving out to three years, it's down to about a one in three chance. So if we were to fish at a level of roughly a TCY of 40 million pounds, we're seeing the probability of getting down to that trigger going from a one in five to a one in four to a one in three over the next three years. Finally, the last um, part of this table reflects the probabilities of decrease in fishery trend and in fishery status. I'll start with trend first. This area that I have highlighted in red here reflects the probability that we would have to take a decrease in fishery yield to get back to our reference level at some point in the future. So for example, if we went with a harvest that was in excess of the reference level of F46, what's the probability that one year from now or two years from now, 
we would have to decrease that yield to get back on the reference level at that point. And you see that those probabilities exceed 50, 50 out of 100 or a 50% chance between 36 and 43 million pounds. So basically, we're looking over that range of, of catches, we're looking at a little better than a 50-50 chance that if we wanted to get back to an F-46 at some point in the next couple of years, we'd have to drop the catch a little bit to do that. Now the last row of this table is a, is a row that I haven't spent a lot of time talking about in previous years, but I mentioned just a few minutes ago in the discussion of fishing intensity. So the last row reflects the probability that if we set a particular catch level, we would actually exceed that reference level of 46%. And the, the value right under the, the, the column for the reference level is 50 out of 100 or 50-50 chance. It's, that's our target. So if we were to take the level of removals associated with F46, we estimate there's a 50-50 chance that we'll be above or below that F46 level. However, if recalling back to the figure I just showed you, noting that we have uncertainty in our level of fishing intensity, if we wanted to set a catch level that was associated with avoiding exceeding that F46%, that's, you could read across the bottom there and select the probability at which you would be willing to exceed that 46%. And as an example, I'll show you a highlight here if we were to set catch limits associated with an F54, a much lower level of fishing intensity, we would have a roughly one out of four chance or 25 out of 100 chance that we would exceed that F46. So that is our other tool to avoid exceeding a, a level of fishing intensity that we might want to, is to consider that row in the decision-making process this week. So to summarize these, these uh, projections, the, as I showed you in the um, fishing intensity plot, the data that we have this year, both from the survey expansion and those recruitment estimates, suggests slightly lower fishing intensity than we estimated in last year's assessment, much closer to where we were back in 2016 with those assessments. The stock decreases estimated um, over the last few years are likely to continue for removals in, in excess of 20 million pounds. And more, perhaps more than any in the, la any in the last several years, the upcoming year's data in 2019 are going to be particularly important in sharpening our understanding of the current dynamics. Uh, this hasn't been a situation we've been in in the last few years, but now we're on the edge of learning something about these 2011 and 12 year classes, which will be important moving forward. And with that, I, I believe we're scheduled for a break. I am happy to take questions at the discretion of the commissioners uh, on this section or and or continue on into the projection tool. Um, why don't we take questions now in this particular section and then we'll take a break and so just see what questions um, commissioners have uh, for your presentation. Go ahead, Neil. Thanks for the presentation, Ian. So on this kind of maybe some education for me, on slides 25 and 26. I was curious to hear from you about, on slide 25, I'm just going there myself, the areas as fleets trends in spawning biomass are pretty tightly together, especially at the end of the time series. And then similarly for the short coast wide and long coast wide. Then you go to the next slide where we're just looking at recruitment and the, the pairing in the trends changes. So now it's long coast wide and long areas as fleets that map most closely with one another and the other two that map close. So the, the kind of the the closeness of the relationship changes. And I was just curious to know, or do we know anything about why that may be? Thank you, I, I can't speak to that. And I, now I realize why the other speakers were moving out here is because it's very hard to hear the questions in the corner back there. Um, I, it's also nice to be able to see you all. Um, 
So th that's an excellent question, and I, I, I welcome the opportunity to uh, discuss why we're using four different models for the, the Pacific Halibut Stock Assessment, and because your question reflects specifically why we need four to characterize all these various dimensions of uncertainty in the stock. Uh, the, the trends that we see in slide 25 are in spawning biomass, and these are being largely driven by how the trend information is being used in each of these stock assessments. So the coastwide models are aggregating the trend information all the way down to one single time series. So when I showed you that multi-panel plot, the coastwide time series is the only thing going into these coastwide models. It's just one single trend. And in doing that, we're losing some of the information about different trends in different um, biological regions associated with different biological components. So that's the primary difference why you see the, the trend difference here, because the areas as fleets models are retaining each of those biological regions, the trend in each of those biological regions and fitting to that directly. So instead of just a single index of abundance in those models, we actually have four different indices of abundance and we're fitting those and reflecting the difference in biology. Now I'd love to be able to tell you that one of those was a clear winner and we could throw the rest away, but unfortunately that's not the case. They both have relative pros and cons associated with those modeling approaches. By using all four, we're able to characterize this uncertainty and not make the mistake of thinking that we might be in one of those models and actually being in, in one of the other ones. So we're, we're capturing that. With regard to the recruitment time series, it's quite accurate that there is a change in which models tend to be more similar to others. And, because, and this is because these are the recruitment estimates back calculated all the way to age zero. And at age zero, the effects of the level of natural mortality in each of these stock assessments is very important. As we project forward, the magnitude of those recruits, if we have higher natural mortality, well, we had to have started with more fish to get to the fish that we subsequently saw in the fishery. So where the number of fish at older ages is converging, regardless of what the natural mortality is, as you go back to younger ages, you get a much bigger spread. And that's the spread you see in this figure. And so in, in, in fact, in this figure, the um, long coastwide model and the long areas as fleets models both estimate higher levels of natural mortality. That would be the black and the green series. And so they have larger estimates of incoming recruitments on an absolute scale. However, you can see that they all have the same um, or similar relative trend in terms of which years were the strong years and which were the, the, were the weak years. Any other questions for you? Peter? Uh, thank you for the presentation, Dr. Stewart. Uh, could you just expound uh, on slide 24, uh, the statement uh, 2018 expansion data um, increased biomass estimates in coastwide. I didn't quite follow. <laughs> I can't. Thank you for the question. The, uh, it increased the estimates in the stock assessment models. And again, it's related to how these data go into the stock assessment models. So what we've seen over the last five years is a cumulative um, change, as Dr. Webster pointed out, in the overall time series that go into these models. And that change has been noticeable at the coastwide level, but it's even more pronounced when you get down to region to region indices of abundance. And in, in fact, the change in scale in the region two index of abundance was quite notable in Dr. Webster's presentation, but what was maybe not quite so notable in his presentation was the change in precision. So the, not only was the time series slightly different as a function of the results of this year's expansion data, but it was much more precise. The, the coefficient of variation or the level of variance, if you will, was about half what it was before we did the expansion, meaning we had a much more informative index of abundance. When I put that index of abundance into the stock assessment models with greater precision, it forces those models to fit those data even better. And the result of that maybe slightly counterintuitive, was to actually increase the absolute scale of those estimates. Didn't change the trend much, but it actually brought the, the biomass estimates in the stock assessment models up slightly. And so that's where this statement comes from. Well, thank you for that. Bob? So Ian, I'm looking at slide 24 also in your second comment. It says uh, survey age data increased the estimate of 2011 and, and 12. And I guess uh, slide 26 really doesn't show that increase. Um, what, 
to what degree did uh, the survey this year or in 2018 show an increase of those two year, year classes? Thank you. I have an extra slide. It'll take me just a second to find it I, that I presented at the interim meeting. Yeah, didn't take me as long as I thought. Um, so this, this slide I presented at the interim meeting and this shows the recruitment time series in the main panel estimated just as I showed you on the previous figure. And the inset here at the top shows you that same time series but estimated without the 2018 age data. So I, I went into the stock assessment models and I cut out the 2018 age data, but I left the rest of the information there, including the estimates of mortality and all the other sources of data. And um, I don't have, I think I have any, well, I do, yes, actually. Uh, just just uh, putting a line across there to give you a point of reference to be able to compare. That line connects the lowest estimates in those year classes between 1999 and 2005 to that 2011 and 2012 estimate. And you can see in the main panel, 11 and 12 are above that line um, for the, the black and the green series. In the upper right there, the, um, both of those estimates are well below that line. And so that is specifically a sensitivity showing you the effect of adding just the age data in 2018. So fairly important um, in terms of our projection moving forward. Um, if we could we go to slide 28. Um, so Ian, I was curious when I look at this slide, all the dots are kind of skewed to one side of the distribution in the earlier years, and then they come down into the midpoint of the precision. And so I just curious what's going on. Like, why is that changing? Thank you. I, I can't address that. This, um, it's, it is quite noticeable that the uh, confidence intervals, especially in the early part of that time series, are not centered on the points. And we're very used to looking at statistics that are based on approximations that have perfectly symmetric uncertainty about them. That's a standard output from many analyses. This analysis, we're, we're reflecting um, four different distributions coming out of each of these four stock assessment models. And so they don't, they're not constrained to be symmetric. The reason why they are quite asymmetric in the early years has to do with what we're showing on this plot. So this is fishing intensity and higher value corresponds to fishing the stock very hard. And so the, the long tails on the lower part are indicative of our uncertainty in that, well, maybe we weren't fishing the stock quite as hard as we thought we were during that time period. What's the probability that that could happen? Well, there is some probability that we were never fishing the stock quite as hard as we thought. On the, on the reverse side, we can be pretty sure that we weren't fishing it in excess of an SPR in the low 20s, because an SPR in, in excess of that would have been much more visible in the dynamics. There's a general um, rule of thumb in fisheries, the harder you fish a stock, the more you learn about it. And we can be pretty sure given the data that we have that we weren't fishing at levels in excess of that. But we can never be sure that we weren't fishing at some lower level with some slightly larger biomass out there. And so that's why we tend to see an asymmetric distribution, particularly for cases where we're fishing at a relatively high intensity. Yeah, thanks Ian for clarifying that. It, it also looks like the uh, precision actually mm, increases in more recent years than past years, but maybe that's just my eyesight from looking at these. Yes, I, I think that you are identifying the, um, the effect of those incoming year classes in that they are, they are be having, a, the, the uncertainty in those year classes is having a larger effect as we're moving forward in this time series. So the farther back you go, the less important are the year classes that are um, now fairly well estimated. So I, I, it's actually not as pronounced as, I would expect this generally to be wider at the end of the time series than it is earlier on. And it's perhaps not quite as pronounced as you might expect. Um, but there is, I, I agree, there is some trend there of, of getting slightly wider in the most recent year. 
Great, I don't see any other questions. So I'm gonna recommend that we take a break um, for 15 minutes and um, it's 3.35. So we'll get back in uh, 15 minutes from now. Thank you. And while everybody is out on break, if you have not already registered for the meeting, please do so.
That's what he's concerned about. And I'll also turn the uh, speaker a little bit. One. Test. Test. Can you hear me? Test one. Test two. Three. Four. Five. Six. Test. Yes, first, um, and I go right after him. So can I can you show me the device? Yeah. It's It'll go off.
uh, everyone could take their seats, we're going to reconvene. All right, if everyone could take their seats, we're going to reconvene, please. I'm going to turn it back over to Dr. Stewart. If I could uh, have somebody click on the PowerPoint. Okay, I don't have much more material this afternoon. I just need somebody to click on the PowerPoint so I have access from the... There we go, thanks. Uh, I don't have much more material for the afternoon here. Uh, just an introduction to the mortality projection tool, which as has been mentioned uh, in the lead up to this session is um, intended to provide a more interactive experience for everybody, both leading up to this meeting and during this meeting in the ability to create as many additional alternative uh, mortality tables as you would like to see um, as the meeting progresses. So the mortality projection tool takes the place of what we were formerly calling the catch table. It's, it's not called the catch table anymore because it's really just reflecting mortality, not catch that's, that survives. And um, it's going to provide you with that detailed breakdown of going from TCEY all the way down through the various catch sharing plans, including the projections of bycatch mortality and uh, discard mortality in the commercial fishery, all the various components, so that you can see in one place the projected mortality by sector and by, by individual IPHC regulatory area um, applying all the catch sharing plans for any alternative you'd like to consider. So the inputs to this tool, this, the, uh, the website here at the bottom should be live, should be um, available for you. There's also a link right at the top of the annual meeting webpage. You click on that, you'll be taken to something that's a white screen with a, with a bunch of outputs and a few inputs. And the inputs are all in yellow. I'm pretty sure at this point, it's been tested quite a lot that you, you can't actually change anything that you don't want to. If you click outside the yellow, it'll just tell you you can't change that, you need to go back. So you can adjust any of those yellow cells. The yellow cells that you have available are the distributed mortality limit, the TCEY, which is the coastwide total of all TCEY that you're looking at. The percent of TCEY in each regulatory area, so you can put in a vector there, you can divide that TCEY up any way you'd like. There are two switches, two drop-down menus. The first is a bycatch option, so you, it is set by default to the previous year's estimates, which is the standard method that the IPHC Secretariat has used to project um, bycatch mortality for the upcoming year. But if you wanted to see, for a particular catch level, you wanted to see, well, what would these catch tables, how, what would the total mortality look like if the full regulatory bycatch limits were, were, to, were actually taken next year, all the way up to the PSC limits, in Alaska and all the way up to the regulatory um, cap or limit in uh, British Columbia and in the lower 48, you could, you could click that tab and see how that would change the, the mortality landscape. Finally, you're, you're allowed to toggle between millions of pounds um, for historical consistency and metric tons if you'd like to see the comparison there. So those are the inputs. What you get out is, as I said, it's that catch table, but it's also more than that. You get an estimate of the projected SPR, or level of fishing intensity, associated with that alternative. Now, this isn't rerunning the stock assessment models behind the scenes, so this is not a perfect estimate of the SPR, but what I've done is preload this, this tool with a wide range of stock assessment runs at varying levels of mortality, and so you'll probably get something that's pretty close to what you would get if we actually ran the stock assessment again to estimate that. So you get the estimated SPR. You'll also get to see the TCEY and the total mortality broken out by individual regulatory area. And that's a place to check to make sure that the math to get the percentages is working the way you thought it would be from the total. Um, you should always see the same total at the end of that, that row. You'll also get a section that provides the modeled stock 
and TCEY distribution so that you can get a sense of the relative harvest rates by biological region. Now, there's no units on these because we don't know the units. It's just a, a relative measure of stock distribution compared to catch distribution. So those, those are provided in a section on the tool. And then, as I mentioned earlier, there's the full detail of mortality tables by individual IPHC regulatory area and sector. And these reflect the application of all of the, the details in the various catch sharing agreements. So in 2C and 3A in Alaska, it does the recreational and um, commercial split. Likewise, in, in British Columbia, in 2A, it approximates the detail there, although it doesn't provide quite as much detail as the 2A people do in, in all those calculations. But it'll, it'll get you a pretty good idea of how these various alternatives will turn out when they're applied through the, the catch sharing agreements. In addition, and this is a little bit of an improvement in the past, I've showed you a number of figures here in the, in the previous presentation looking at projections of spawning biomass and fishing intensity. Well, now you'll get the ability to have those figures updated as you put in alternatives to show that alternative as well. So you'll see a spawning biomass projection that reflects the alternative that you've just put into the tool. You'll get an, a projection of the relative fishing intensity with that time series along with it. And um, you'll also get some figures reflecting the harvest rate by biological region, as well as the mortality by source and regulatory areas. You can compare the, the distribution of mortality across sources and regulatory areas. Now, the input cells, the yellow cells in this tool, are preloaded with some default values that represent the IPHC's interim management procedure. So I've, I've discussed several times the reference level with regard to the decision table. Well, the reference SPR of 46% is where the scale comes from in the interim management procedure. So that they, the values that are preloaded into the mortality tool reflect an SPR of 46%. And then in addition, to distribute that um, mortality across the entire coastwide range of, of um, sectors and areas, uh, the same method is used in this tool in the default as has been used in previous calculations. So previously the blue line and then subsequent iterations of the IPHC's interim management procedure has used the model 032 survey distribution by individual regulatory area and has applied to that relative harvest rates of 1.0 in regulatory areas 2A to 3A and 0.75 in areas 3B to 4C, D, and E. So noting that this management procedure is currently under development, and it's be the focus of my colleague, Dr. Alan Hicks's presentation tomorrow. Um, for historical comparability, we've provided those default values in the, the tool um, for you to use. So if you open the tool, the values that are already there for you and the results that you see in front of you will reflect consistency with previous year's calculations of the interim management procedure. Now, in addition, I realize that you may want to go back and compare to um, some other, other alternatives and other years and see how these things have changed over time. So in this presentation, I'm also going to provide you with um, this table, which is the ref reference TCEYs, applying that um, interim management procedure in each of these years. So these are the actual results from each year as time has gone on um, by region. Of the, so this is the distribution of TCEY by region as we calculated it in each year, not, not looking backwards. And then in addition, um, the recent adopted TCEYs by biological region for that same time, time period as well, so that you can compare a particular alternative. Well, how does this fit in with what the management procedure has been saying over the last few years and what's actually been adopted? And then I'll also provide tables that have the reference TCEYs um, down to individual regulatory area as calculated by that interim management procedure, as well as the adopted TCEYs by regulatory area. So these, again, this presentation is available through the, the annual meeting um, website. You'll find it listed under um, documents 8, 9, and 11. I believe the PowerPoint is available through any of those, those links. And um, these slides are there to provide you if you want to compare alternatives in the projection tool to the recent history, both of the um, adopted TCEYs as well as the reference TCEYs, you can then do that. Now, I'll finish with just a couple of um, maybe, maybe advanced um, user tricks for the projection tool, which is that if you've used it much, 
um, you, we, we're encouraging you to start with a target coastwide TCEY and work your way down with percentages to the individual regulatory area, but recognizing that you may want to um, consider a vector of just TCEYs rather than having to, to adjust percentages. So if you wanted to do that, you can actually paste those TCEYs directly into the vector of percents and then put your total in. And the tool will renormalize those to add up to 100% and redistribute them back out as TCY. And you can look and see the results to, to check and make sure it worked as you wanted. So again, if you wanted to take, say, a vector of these values and put them right into those yellow cells in the tool, you'll get a little red warning in the corner that it doesn't add to 100%, but you'll be able to see the tables associated with those values. So that's, that's just one way that might save you a little time if you're trying to adjust certain things but don't want everything to, to readjust as you go along. Another point that I'd like to make, uh, and I'm not actually gonna call the tool up and try to do a live demo here. Uh, I'm gonna be here all week and, and available to help anybody who's having um, any, any trouble or just, just has questions about the tool. I'll also be moving back and forth between the conference board and the PAB and, and other places to help those processes if they want to use the tool. I will note that the tool, we've discovered that the tool um, is, can be challenging to print from the website. So you can't download it because we, we might need to be update it. Um, but the way to print it is to take a screenshot and print the screenshot. If you try to just copy the web page and print that, you're probably not going to get the kind of performance that you want um, from some copying some documents. So I encourage you to try just taking a screenshot and printing that if you want to save the results of a particular run. And with that, I think I can, I can take questions on this or, or any of the other material as well. Okay, thanks very much. Any questions for Dr. Stewart? No, I think we've exhausted questions from ourselves. Thanks very much, Ian. Thank you. So I'm going to move on to the next item. Um, Joseph is going to give us an overview of the research plans. So this is the five-year research program that Joseph will be speaking to, and there's a paper um, AM95-14 that you'll find lots of detail. So over to you, Joseph. Thank you, Chair. Um, good afternoon, Commissioners. Uh, I would like to present to you an update on our five-year biological and ecosystem system science uh, research program. Uh, I would like to start uh, stating um, the um, items that will be covered in the presentation, starting with uh, a brief description of the five-year research program and management implications, uh, followed up by uh, progress on the ongoing uh, research activities, uh, a brief mention on the uh, planned future uh, research activities for 2019, uh, also a brief mention of the external research funding and ending with uh, our presentation of the new biological laboratory uh, at IPHC. I would like to start uh, this presentation by uh, stating first, what are the primary objectives of the biological research program? Uh, and the first one is to identify and address critical knowledge gaps in the biology of Pacific halibut. Uh, secondly, to understand the influence of environmental conditions on Pacific halibut biology. And finally, to apply the resulting knowledge uh, to reduce uncertainty in current uh, stock assessment models. It is important to understand uh, what factors are affecting uh, or influencing biomass and in particularly spawning biomass. Uh, for example, uh, of, um, how biomass and spawning biomass uh, uh, affects or influences recruitment through reproductive potential or reproductive output, and in turn, how recruitment can influence spawning biomass uh, through growth, uh, migration, and survival of those recruits. Um, in order to address uh, these issues or some of these issues, uh, we are currently uh, conducting work in uh, several research areas, including migration, uh, growth, reproduction, 
and also on discard mortality rates and uh, discard uh, survival, and also taking into account the uh, effects of the fishing pressure and predation, and particularly uh, whale predation. The uh, primary research areas that are contemplated in our five-year research plan are the following, uh, migration, uh, reproduction, growth, uh, discard mortality rates and discard survival, and genetics and genomics. And the main objectives of the research area on migration are primarily to improve our understanding of migration throughout all life stages. That is larval, juvenile, adult feeding and reproductive migrations. And the management implications of this work is, uh, are related to stock distribution and regional management. Uh, the main objectives of the research area in reproduction are to provide information on sex ratios of the commercial landings and to improve maturity estimates. And uh, those uh, objectives are important for uh, our estimates of female uh, spawning biomass. The main objectives of the research area on growth are to improve our understanding of factors that are responsible for changes in size at age and the development of tools for monitoring growth and physiological condition of Pacific halibut. And uh, these uh, objectives are important for our uh, current uh, biomass estimations. Um, the main objectives of the research area on discard mortality rates and discard survival are to obviously improve our estimates of uh, DMRs in the directed long line and guided recreational fisheries. The management implica implications are uh, discard mortality estimates. The last uh, research area, genetics and genomics, has as its uh, main objectives to improve our understanding of the genetic structure of the population and to create genomic tools, that is the genome, in order to further study uh, this uh, uh, genetic composition of the population. The management implications are stock distribution, local adaptation, etc. One of the major goals in our research program is to ensure that the biological research activities uh, are well integrated with the needs of stock assessment and the MSC process, the management strategy evaluation process, uh, in order for these two uh, to uh, help inform um, policy decisions. Um, for all the five uh, research areas that you see here on the left column, uh, we're actually working towards producing research outputs that are relevant for stock assessment and that provide direct inputs for both stock assessment and MSC development. Uh, as an example, uh, um, one of the research outputs of the research area migration uh, is uh, further understanding of, our, uh, of juvenile and adult distribution and eventually migration rates. Uh, and this is uh, relevant for stock assessment and provides uh, inputs for stock assessment in our in, in improved understanding of stock distribution and it also represents a direct input uh, into the operating model of the MSC process. Uh, to draw another example uh, from, in this case, the area, the research area on reproduction, um, uh, for instance, the sex ratio of commercial landings, uh, this represents a valuable input uh, uh, in the form of information on sex ratio at age that uh, is used by stock assessment in order to determine the scale and the trend of spawning biomass and that it also in, is a direct input uh, into the uh, operated model for the MSC process. Uh, this slide shows um, um, the different, how the different research outputs uh, are actually temporarily integrated into the MSC and um, the stock assessment process. And uh, as an example, you can see here the research area migration and how uh, different research outputs that uh, are um, produced through um, tagging, sample collection, data analysis, and data synthesis uh, feed in into the stock assessment and MSC process. Uh, and one of our expectations is that towards the end of 2019, we can provide um, uh, outputs related to larval distribution and uh, related to adult and juvenile migration um, in 2020 and subsequently. Uh, another example of a research area that uh, temporarily impinges with uh, the stock assessment and the MSC process is the area on reproduction. 
sorry, this is not working. Could you advance to the next? Yeah, okay, thank you. An example on uh, how this uh, temporarily uh, relates with the needs of uh, stock assessment and MSC is in the reproduction area, where this uh, is in one of the first examples of how uh, outputs uh, are already being used in stock assessment, and that is related to the sex ratio. Um, in early 2019, as you can see, and again in early 2020, and hopefully by the end of 2019, early 2020, we can also have research outputs related to maturity estimates um, feeding into uh, those two processes. And a last example would be related to growth where um, uh, effects on, uh, of temperature on growth or uh, information on growth patterns uh, after a period of data analysis and synthesis, and synthesis can be um, um, provide inputs into stock assessment towards the second half of 2020. Uh, let me move on on to our uh, progress on ongoing research projects, and I would like to start with the first um, research area, that is migration, where we have four projects. The first one is larval distribution and connectivity. The second one is migration of under 32 Pacific halibut. The third one is uh, seasonal and reproductive migrations as uh, studied by archival tagging. And the fourth one is tail pattern recognition. The first project, uh, larval distribution and connectivity, has as its uh, main objective, uh, um, understanding of the contribution of spawning grounds to settlement grounds, uh, including information on connectivity of ocean basins. And specifically, we're looking at the connectivity between the Gulf of Alaska and the Bering Sea, and also looking at uh, environmental effects on larval distribution. Uh, this is a project that is in collaboration with the ECOFOSI group at NOAA, at the Alaska Fishery Science Center in Seattle, and, and we're actually looking at um, um, model representations of larval density, as you can see in this slide, uh, in uh, different periods uh, with different um, um, environmental conditions. In this case, is looking at um, a representation of larval density in uh, a warm period, 2001, 2005, and the idea is to compare this with other periods with other environmental um, um, conditions. So the first phase uh, is scheduled for completion in, 2000, in late 2019. The second project, uh, which is uh, um, understanding migration of uh, under 32 fish through wire tagging, uh, has involved since 2015 the tagging with wire tags of uh, close to 9,000 fish uh, and the locations of the release of those 9,000 fish have been, can be seen in this map in those um, uh, green dots. Uh, those fish have been tagged both in our own fisheries independent set line survey as well as in the NIMS trawl survey. And uh, during this relatively short period of tagging, uh, we've had 74 recoveries and we hope that with continued tagging and uh, as this fish move into the fishery, uh, we're going to increase the number of tags returned and we're going to learn about um, possibly migration patterns. Uh, just to give you an idea, last uh, year in 2018, we tagged a little over 1,700 fish in our own survey and close to 1,000 fish in the NIMS trawl survey. The third project is electronic archival tagging. And, and so far this year in 2000, in last year, 2018, uh, we've uh, tagged 255 fish with this uh, electronic archival tags that record temperature, depth, and light. And we've released those uh, coastwide, and the numbers of fish that have been tagged with this archival tags uh, in, in the different regulatory areas is shown by the um, red numbers. Uh, in addition to those archival tags, we've also released 13 satellite tags uh, in the 4B area in order to further understand uh, seasonal and reproductive migrations of adult fish. And obviously our rewards are offered for tag as well as autolith uh, recoveries. The fourth uh, project that we are conducting in the area of migration is one that we call tail pattern recognition. And as you can see in this picture, the natural markings on the tail uh, are uh, hopefully being used to identify individuals over time and help us inform on movement patterns and growth. What we've learned from this pilot study so far is that the blind side of the tail is preferable for imaging. 
and that importantly, the spots and patterns appear to be unique among individuals. Um, those markings can be used to identify individuals with image uh, recognition software. So uh, what we're conducting right now is just a collection of images from our trawl survey, Cod Fish, uh, and establishing a database of images that can be drawn later on to identify, potentially identify individuals. Uh, so the, in the future, we, we see the possibility of integrating electronic monitoring into vessels or um, in so shoreside uh, for uh, recognition of, of, of specific markings on tails or to develop in the future, uh, possibly recreational fisher applications. Uh, in 2018, uh, we um, photographed the tails and we wiretagged specifically 827 under 32 Pacific halibut as part of this project that is continuing in 2019 in our fisheries independence satellite survey. In the temporal integration of research outcomes and, um, and the stock assessment and NSC uh, process, uh, I include some of the uh, research outcomes uh, from the larval and distribution connectivity here is shown in red. Uh, for instance, the application of the Dr. Webster's space and time model um, um, representing that larval um, uh, density plots, and as well as that mentioned modeling that is being done in conjunction with uh, the Alaska Fisheries Science Center. And this, we see those outcomes uh, being integrated uh, towards the end of 2019. The uh, electronic archival tagging, the data from uh, light-based geopositioning uh, will help us analyze age and sex-specific movements of those fish that are tagged and returned and to eventually develop spatially explicit models. Um, the depth data that those tags are providing us uh, will also uh, be used to um, analyze uh, off onshore, onshore uh, migrations and um, refine definitions of effective spawning biomass. I'd like to make a note that uh, in the uh, room outside um, where the registration takes place, uh, there are a series of posters, uh, one including um, uh, for the research area on migration and for all the other research areas I'm going to be describing uh, for you, for your viewing. Uh, those posters are going to be out uh, for the rest of the week. And, and in fact, uh, tomorrow they will be moved to the IPHC reception. So you'll have a chance to uh, look at them a little more casually. Uh, and I'll be happy to um, describe or go a little bit into further details uh, for any of these projects. So I'll be around all week. The second area of research is reproduction. And we, here we have two projects. So one is the uh, genetic identification of sex in the commercial landings. And the second one is the full characterization of the annual reproductive cycle of Pacific halibut. Uh, the first project has as, as its objective to provide sex data from the commercial landings for stock assessment. And um, we have now developed uh, assays, genetic assays, that allow us to, uh, with high certainty, uh, identify males uh, from females. And using this uh, genetic techniques, uh, this genotyping effort, uh, we have been able to um, determine the sex ratio of the 2017 commercial samples. Uh, a little over 10,000 samples have been genotyped and have been, uh, are now being used in the 2019 full stock assessment. The second project, the full characterization of the annual reproductive cycle has as its main objective to revise maturity estimates for both male and female Pacific halibut. Uh, and uh, this project is intended to provide detailed information on gonadal growth, gonadal maturation, spawning, basically covering an annual reproductive cycle in the species. And we've conducted this study, uh, at least the sample collection part, uh, in the Portlock region in the central Gulf of Alaska uh, by collecting monthly samples from September of 2017 until August of 2018. And we've been collecting biological samples and biological information from 30 males and 30 females every month. Uh, and with these samples, we're actually conducting histological assessment of gonadal development as we speak. Uh, we're gonna be looking at uh, the levels of reproductive hormones in the blood. Uh, we're gonna look for signs of activation of the endocrine reproductive axis, both in the pituitary and the gonads. Uh, we're also gonna relate maturity with energy levels, uh, fat content uh, in the muscle or the hepatosomatic index, uh, a, a measure of liver weight. 
uh, and we're going to be revising uh, the scoring criteria of maturity stages um, that is currently being, currently being used by our sea samplers uh, using macroscopic app, uh, observations in the field. So with this study, what we hope to uh, improve is the staging of reproductive status, to provide an accurate staging, to update current estimates of maturity at age, and to provide estimates, if any, of skip spawning in this species. Again, we have two posters for viewing outside. Where this uh, activities uh, temporarily relate with the stock assessment and MSC process, I would like to highlight that uh, for stock assessment, the first research output that is available for management is the 2017 commercial landing sex ratio uh, and um, the maturity archives, uh, the maturity information uh, will be provided hopefully towards the end of 2019. Moving on to the third research area of the five indicated, uh, we have two projects. The first one is identification and validation of physiological markers for growth. And the second one is evaluation of growth patterns in the Pacific halibut population and possible effects on, of environmental variability. Obviously, these projects are related or are fundamental to the, those observed changes in size and age. The first project, identification and validation of physiological markers for growth, is intended to, as the title indicates, provide tools to measure growth in the Pacific halibut population. And uh, we have conducted a captive study with juvenile Pacific halibut uh, in which we have been investigating the effects of temperature, population density, dominance, and even capture stress on growth and uh, identifying in the process physiological markers that can uh, tell us or give us a, a good idea of what markers can be used uh, for application to field studies. This is a, a study that has been done in collaboration with the Alaska Fishery Science Center at uh, Newport in Oregon and is partially funded by an NPRB grant that um, uh, has been spanning from 2017 to uh, September of this year, 2019. Again, we have a poster uh, on this topic for viewing for any of you who are interested. Uh, the second project is uh, evaluation of growth patterns in the Pacific halibut population, is how can we apply those physiological growth markers that we're in the process of developing uh, uh, into uh, field studies. Um, so for this purpose, uh, we've been collecting over the last three years, since 2016, uh, muscle samples from fish that have been caught in the NIMS trawl survey. These are relatively young fish uh, from um, three different size categories, uh, from fish that are under 40 centimeters in fork length, fish that are between 40 and 60, and fish that are between 60 and 80 centimeters in fork length, with the idea to determine whether there's, uh, in H match individuals, the, uh, determine whether the size difference are related to growth differences. Uh, another important, apologize for this, Another component, important component in this project is sorry. Another important component of this study is the investigation of the effects of environmental variability and the influence of thermal history on growth patterns. And here uh, we are using those tags that I described before, the archival tags that record uh, temperature uh, in uh, relating. Uh, temperature history to autolith chemistry uh, by collecting those isotopes from those fish that are attacked, uh, determining their temperature history and relating that to growth. Uh, so we're using uh, autoliths as uh, temperature recorders. How we see these uh, activities temporarily related uh, with the needs of stock assessment and MSC process are shown in this slide where temperature dependent growth information and even productivity information um, um, are likely going to be provided to the stock assessment and MSC processes uh, by mid 2020. The fourth research area is uh, discard mortality rates and post release survival assessment in Pacific halibut. Here we have two projects. The first one is uh, named Improvement of DMR estimations 
in the directed long line fishery. And the second one is the estimation of DMRs in the guided recreational fishery. The first project um, we received uh, uh, partial funding from the Salton Stall Kennedy um, NOAA um, grant program. And for the second one, the DMRs in the guided recreational fishery, we just received external funding from the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation. Uh, the first study, the DMR estimations in the directed long line fishery is a study that has been uh, conducting, conducted in collaboration with uh, Alaska Pacific University. And the second one, the DMRs in the guided recreational fishery is in collaboration with the Alaska uh, University of Alaska Fairbanks, again, Alaska Pacific University and the Alaska Charter Association. Uh, let me describe uh, some of the uh, uh, objectives and outcomes of the first uh, project, which is the, the one on DMRs in the directed long line fishery. Uh, in this project, we first aim to establish a relationship between handling practices uh, and injury levels and physiological condition of released Pacific halibut. In fact, the first step on this project was to assess the injuries that are associated with different release techniques um, that are common in the directed longline fishery, namely careful shake, uh, ganging cutting, and hook stripping. And some of the first results that we obtain are shown in this graph where on the vertical axis, you see the percentage of uh, fish per release method from zero to 100%. And on the horizontal axis, you see the different release conditions, the, the different injury categories from excellent on the left, moderate, poor, and dead. And here you see the results from the three different uh, release techniques, um, careful shake and ganging cutting in green and blue. And you can see that a high percentage of fish released uh, uh, with this uh, release techniques are in the excellent category, as opposed to the fish that have been subjected to the hook stripper, where most of the fish are in fact in poor and subsequently in moderate condition as you would expect. Secondly, we intend to determine the physiological condition of those released fish by uh, calculating growth uh, or condition factor indices. Those are relationships between usually weight and length, uh, but also to determine the levels of blood stress indicators and also the energy levels of fish and relate those to the capture conditions, time of capture, time on deck, water temperature, temperature on deck, even fish temperature. And the second component of this uh, study is to relate all these parameters with survival. So uh, we intend to assess survival post-release as assessed by tagging using two types of tags, wire tags, and we tagged uh, 1,048 fish that included fish from all handling practices and all release conditions. And then we also tagged with accelerometer tags um, a subset of those fish that were only in excellent condition. And in this map, you can see the dispersal of those fish uh, at 96 days after release. So you can see that those fish, in fact, moved considerably, some, in some cases, considerable distances from the site of uh, release uh, after capture. Um, consistent with this high degree of dispersal is the low mortality associated uh, with uh, capture of fish in excellent condition. And the results uh, that uh, we obtained were about a mortality of 4%, which is consistent with um, the uh, DMRs that are currently uh, being considered. An interesting component of this study is the application of electronic monitoring and DMR estimation. So in the vessel uh, where these uh, studies were conducted, uh, an electronic monitoring system was installed, video recording was taken from all handling events during capture, and uh, what we intend to do is to uh, try to determine the injury profile by the released method that is captured on video. And uh, what we can say so far is the when you compare the electronic monitoring uh, determined release method to the actual, the correlation is incredibly high. Um, sometimes 100% um, um, uh, in the case of uh, careful shake, but close to uh, you know, 97 to 95% when we consider ganging cutting or hook stripping. So EM actually captures very well the actual release method. 
And we have a poster outside as well describing um, the progress on this project. The second project is the uh, estimating uh, discard mortality rates in the guided recreational fishery. This is a project that will be initiated uh, later this year. Uh, and the objectives are the following. Uh, first, the collection of information on hook types and sizes and handling practices uh, used in this fishery. Uh, secondly, to investigate the relationship between gear types and capture conditions and the size composition of captured fish. The third objective is to provide information on injury profiles and uh, physiological stress levels of captured fish and uh, to assess mortality of discarded fish uh, using uh, satellite uh, accelerometer tags like the ones that we use for the discard uh, mortality rate on the directed longline fishery. We see those um, research outcomes being integrated uh, into stock assessment and MSC process towards the second half of 2019 and, and furthermore in uh, 2020. Let me move on to uh, a brief description on the projects that we planned for 2019 and those projects are five. Uh, the first one is uh, an up-to-date genetic analysis of population structure in Pacific halibut. Uh, we plan on collecting genetic samples from spawning fish in regulatory area 4B and revisit the genetic analysis that were previously conducted uh, using microsatellites, but now using more um, um, state-of-the-art techniques uh, in order to refine our uh, estimates of, um, of uh, genetic population um, structure. Uh, the second uh, project is uh, dispersal and recruitment success of juvenile Pacific halibut. And here we are planning on applying a combination of genetics and autolith uh, chemical analysis to understand uh, juvenile distribution and recruitment success. Uh, the third one is to conduct investigations on chalky uh, Pacific halibut. And uh, what we plan is to initiate this project by collecting information from stakeholders uh, on the incidence of chalky flesh and in order to try to understand possible causes leading to its development. Uh, the management implications in this case are uh, the landed value. And um, we would love to uh, get any information from any stakeholders uh, on this topic. And um, we have two additional uh, new projects uh, that, uh, in fact, IPHC is participating as a collaborator. The first one is on whale detection techniques. This is a project that is led by Alpha and is funded by the Bycatch Reduction Engineering Program uh, grant. Um, and is related to the use of acoustic toad array hydrophones for whale detection. And some of these uh, hydrophones uh, are going to be um, um, installed in uh, some of our uh, survey vessels this summer. Uh, this is obviously related to whale depredation. And finally, uh, we're also involved in a project that is led by the Pacific, Pacific States uh, Marine Fisheries Commission uh, that is again funded by the BREP and NOAA funding project, and that is related to the use of uh, LED lights uh, in trawl gear to facilitate escape responses of Pacific halibut. And the um, relevance of this project is obviously bycatch, re bycatch reduction. Um, I would like to make a brief mention on the projects that uh, IPHC uh, has received uh, external funding for, uh, and those are the two projects that I've mentioned already, the uh, Salton Stall Kennedy uh, on the discard uh, mortality rates in the, the um, recreation in the uh, this, in the um, uh, directed longline fishery, uh, the NPRB grant on growth, and um, lastly in row number five you see the National Marine Fish and Wildlife Foundation grant that uh, IPHC is leading on discard mortality rates in the uh, recreational fishery. The other lines three and four represent the uh, projects that um, um, IPHC is collaborating with Alpha and Pacific States uh, Marine Fisheries Commission. And lastly, I would like to um, present to you the new biological lab at IPHC. Um, we hired in March of 2018 a laboratory, biological laboratory technician, Ms. Uh, Anna Simeon. Uh, she's full-time. Um, uh, she has a two-year appointment and her salary is co-financed by the NPRB grant. Uh, she's been instrumental in setting up uh, this uh, biological laboratory at our, our office uh, in, in Seattle. 
Um, it's uh, fairly well equipped with uh, instrumentation such as uh, PCR machine, spectrophotometer, microplate reader, etc. And what's most important is what we can do with this. And our current lab capabilities include uh, nucleic acid extraction and quantification and genotyping, which is important for you know determining sex ratios through genetics means, but also the planned work on genetics and migration. Um, we can also do gene expression analysis, which are important for our current work on growth and reproduction. Uh, we can do blood metabolite and hormone determinations, which is important for the project related to discard survival and reproduction. And importantly, we can also uh, use the lab as a training platform for staff and students. And I would like to just finish up just highlighting that uh, at the end of 2018, we we're actually able to produce the first output with the direct management application. And that was the sex ratios of the 2017 commercial landings that are gonna be used in the 2019 assessment. Thank you. Thanks very much, um, Dr. Planas, of that very comprehensive uh, overview of the research plans that uh, are in place and ones that are planned for the future. Um, just before we go on, Steve, there's a sign-up sheet Maybe I'll turn it over to you to explain. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, just a reminder for everybody here in the room, if you'd like to speak during the public comment, there's a sign up at the back of the room where Mike Larson is and he'll help you with that. And uh, whoever is listed on there will call up to the microphone here at the front when the time comes. So please sign up at the back if you'd like to make a comment or ask a question from this afternoon's sessions. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Uh, any questions from the commissioners uh, or Dr. Planis? Bob. Joseph, um, I'm looking at slide uh, 24. <clears throat> and um, the color codes of the uh, fish that migrated or, or moved, um, I'm trying to figure out what those colors represent. Uh, are they f excellent condition, poor condition? Uh, no, no, uh, and Commissioner Alberson, I, I, I should have made a mention of this, uh, and I thank you for bringing this up. Uh, it was a little more detailed than I intended to provide, but the different colors represent um, not fish under different conditions. Those were all released um, uh, in excellent condition, but rather the different colors uh, indicate uh, the month where fish were reported. They were all tagged and released between October and November of 2017. And the colors indicate when uh, those fish were, um, uh, the tags came up and the information related to their survivability uh, at large um, uh, took place. Um, so were those done on um, one of our charters that we do, uh, IPHC charter boats? And no, this, this was outside um, the uh, survey season. This was conducted uh, at the end of October and beginning of November in a specially chartered vessel. And one last question. I, it says these movements took place over 96 days. Are you surprised at the degree of movement of these fish uh, um, compared to previous uh, assumptions of movement? Now, this is fairly consistent with what, um, what we've known on movement of, of this fish, as uh, Dr. Ian Stewart commented on before, um, uh, especially fish um, that are tagged in these areas uh, and in other areas show a remarkable um, amount of movement. And this is, this is quite representative of, of, of the type of movements that we expect to see. And Neil? Thanks for this, Josep. Um, I was wondering where you see sort of assessing productivity overall um, emerging out of these different research areas that you've described in some of the early slides. So, I mean, I imagine it's kind of a combination of various pieces of the work you're proposing. Um, but do you envision sort of synthesizing understanding of productivity and how it may vary over the range of, of halibut? Uh, thank you, Commissioner Davis. Uh, yes, uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, the intention is, um, is to, in the near future, to be able to provide 
information on productivity. And in fact, in one of my slides, uh, uh, productivity is, is one of the um, probably more important inputs that the work on growth uh, will provide to stock assessment and, and uh, the MSC process. Uh, after a period of, as you said, um, data synthesis, um, in order to achieve that goal to synthesize that data and uh, provide information on productivity, I think this work is actually linked with uh, one of the recommendations from the scientific review board to hire uh, a life history modeler that will allow us to synthesize that information that we're uh, producing right now on um, thermal influences on growth um, and um, growth manipulations into uh, a more uh, tangible uh, product for management use uh, through um, um, a data synthesis or modeling effort. And do you have any sense of kind of the, the time horizon for being able to do this kind of work and synthesis? I think in this in the slide where I had the uh, the timeline of uh, integration between the research outcomes and specifically the uh, productivity, I think we're talking reasonably 24 months uh, from now where we could expect uh, with the help of a life history modeler to be able to um, derive information related to productivity. I'm not seeing any more questions from uh, commissioners. So thanks again, Joseph, on the presentation. Steve, I'm gonna turn it over to you to see who has questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have uh, three speakers signed up to speak and we'll just go in the order. And the first one is Jeff Kaufman who has a question for Dr. Stewart about mortality distribution. Should I wait or should I go? Okay. So again, this is for this is for Dr. Stewart and uh, basically understanding um, what the stock distribution is. We understand that part. Um, but should how should the stock distribution translate into mortality distribution by regulatory area from from a scientific perspective or from your professional perspective? <laughs> So uh, I'm awake now. <laughs> Would you like me to repeat that? Maybe I'll just come. We've, we've lost all just, sound. Everything's off now. Test one, test one, test one, test one. Okay, I promise not to do that again. Wish I knew what I did, but. Um, <clears throat> perhaps I'll rephrase the question, make sure I understand. Okay. So the, I believe that the question was, We've shown um, several results illustrating the biological stock distribution 
and but there's another link to get between that and the distribution of TCY and what what are the scientific inputs that we have available to help us with that second piece is that close mm, that might be a, that that might be um, too scientific for me to to understand how you, how you phrase it so basically we understand what stock distribution is you have it here by percentage by by regional area and then we're just wondering how that should translate into um, distributed mortality by regulatory area from your from in your opinion or from a profession or from a scientific perspective and I guess the reason that I asked that is for instance last year um, area four had 11.3 percent of the distributed stock but yet it had nine percent about of the distributed mortality and again in, in this year and even in this model here we see maybe it's tightening a little bit but there's a discrepancy between the two and we're just wondering from a scientific perspective if that's the right way or or even what you're I guess in the ideal world how you would address that okay well there's several several components and I think the, the short answer is this is a challenge there are there are some clear scientific inputs like the stock distribution as we see it through this modeled set line survey that are obvious um, pieces of information that we can go out and collect and are relevant to the discussion. However, when we combine that with other information to generate a catch distribution, we begin to blend the scientific inputs and the management inputs. And so the choice of the relative harvest rates and the difference that you, you've identified in um, between the raw stock distribution and the distribution of TCEY that you'll see, for example, in the mortality projection tool, reflects the relative harvest rates that have been applied to halibut in the recent in the recent past at least over the last decade of uh, relative rates of 1.0 in the eastern side of the stock and 0.75 in the western side of the stock now those rates reflect a combination of scientific inputs and management decision the scientific components that went into those at the time those were developed there was discussion around additional uncertainty in the western side of the stock leading to the inclination to use a lower relative harvest rate on the western side of the stock. I would say that discussion is getting fairly dated because we now have good information throughout the whole range of the stock and have had for some time through our um, set line survey. Uh, the other information that went into those relative harvest rates was uh, yield per recruit analysis looking at essentially the relative productivity among the different um, IPHC regulatory areas, noting that some areas have fish that grow faster and therefore can produce more yield per fish than other areas. And generally the eastern side of the stock was recognized to have a higher level of productivity through that analysis. And therefore that was a, an additional rationale for having a relative harvest rate of 1.0 on the eastern side of the stock and 0.75 on the west. Um, what makes this question very challenging is that um, over the last several years, the IPHC Secretariat has reviewed the information that we have available to us to delineate stock distribution and have come to the conclusion that biological regions provides um, a much more compelling basis for determining biological stock distribution. But we have not yet developed um, relative harvest rates to go with those biological regions. So essentially we are in an interim phase where we have um, a harvest policy in development that you'll hear more about from my colleague, Dr. Hicks, focusing on using stock distribution to get to the regional level and then potentially using other tools beyond that. But the reality is that the, the only tools that we have in hand right now um, are the interim management procedure. And so we've provided that for continuity uh, noting that there is further development going on. Mr. Chair, might I, might I follow up? Yeah, go ahead, Jeff. Okay. Um, so basically, I'm looking at your projection tool, and it has the default numbers in it, which is a TCY of 40 million pounds. It's at F46. Uh, it's got the distributed mortality limit by area. And then when you go down in the same in the same projection tool, Looking at area two, for instance, it shows the biological dis stock distribution at 23.1%, but the distributed mortality at 29.9%, or 
a relative harvest rate of 1.37, which is slightly different than you know the 1.0 in the eastern and the 0.75 in the in the western areas. And so I'm just trying to figure out why the distribution or why this projection tool produces those numbers under this under the default settings. And and maybe you've already got to that, and I'm a little slow. No, in fact, that's an excellent question. And it's something that I didn't um, I didn't didn't bring up in my presentation which is that we have several different metrics with which to describe relative stock distribution. So the interim management procedure has used for years the O32 stock distribution. But the what's reflected in the mortality projection tool as an output is our current best estimate of stock distribution, which is including all sizes of fish captured on the IPHC set line survey. And so that's why you'll see a difference between the inputs, even if you aggregate them up to the regional level and the outputs. So again, to, to, to recap that, for historical continuity, we have always used the O32 stock distribution as the input to the interim management procedure. But the output you're seeing in the mortality projection tool is a scientific output. That's our current best estimate of stock distribution, and that's based on all sizes captured in the set line survey. Thank you. Thank you. The next next question is uh, from Chuck Ashcroft that has to do with U26 bycatch. So I'll ask Dr. Stewart to take it first. Thanks, Dr. Stewart. Yeah, my, my question is, is regarding the treatment of U26 bycatch, and I understand it, it's moved into the assessment and taken away from responsibility. But in light of the fact that last year, at least utilizing the mortality tool, you were somewhere in the neighborhood of 1,730,000 pounds of U26 bycatch, is it not time to maybe start looking at the, and moving that into part of the harvest policy and where there's responsibility attached with, at least to some degree, and if not, is there a rationale why it can't be done? Um, sure, the, the zero to two-year-olds do not move much. They don't migrate much, and they can't migrate very far until they get past that age. But after that, and regardless, a dead fish can't migrate anywhere. And as you know, Canada is particularly concerned with bycatch and how it's affecting Canada. Um, and I just wonder if there's any rationale that you could add to that. And, and one other co uh, comment is on the mortality tool, certainly from my perspective, and uh, I would say maybe Candace's perspective, the tool didn't address bycatch and, and be able to adjust bycatch as part of an active portion of the tool. Like if we could say, well, if, what if we we're able to come to 100% agreement in this meeting could bycatch be dropped by 300,000 or 500,000 pounds in some manner? That can't be reflected with the mortality tool to understand how that could spread through for, for uh, the distribution. So thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I think I'll take the second question first with regard to uh, bycatch in the mortality projection tool. If it was desirable to have more flexibility in input levels of bycatch in that tool. It would take a considerable amount of work to preload the assessment models ahead of time to make that possible, but that's certainly something that could be added to that tool in the future. Um, it, it is The reason it's not there now is because historically, discussion of alternative levels of bycatch has not been a focal point during the discussions in, in this meeting, uh, but that is certainly a, a, an extension to the tool that could be added in the future. Related to your first question with regard to the effects of U26 bycatch, uh, I think you, you accurately stated that the reason currently we don't take the U26 bycatch out of a particular regulatory area is because we recognize the fact that those fish have the ability to move before they're going to graduate into, uh, largely into the directed fisheries, and they could be throughout the range of the stock by the time that happens. Uh, I will note that the effects of U26 bycatch are included in the SPR because they're included in the stock assessment. So they're accounted for in the SPR values that come out of that mortality projection tool. Uh, and I understood from some of the opening remarks uh, that some of the work that the secretariat's been doing um, leading up to this meeting may be released 
in the form of a collection of um, briefing notes. And, and one of the analyses that the Secretariat did was to provide a distributed analysis of the effects of U26 bycatch on each IPHC regulatory area. So that may actually provide some additional information um, to better understand the potential effects of U26 on an area by area or region by region basis. Thank you. Thank you. And the next speaker is uh, Dan Falvey, who has a question about the decision table. Thank you. Uh, through the chair, Ian, could you bring up the decision table on the slide? Yes, yeah, so if I could have the um, my PowerPoint back up, please. Thank you. Fishery trends is the one I'm looking at. Yeah, and so thank you for the opportunity. So um, I think if we discussed this a little bit, but my understanding of the fishery trends section and decision table is the probabilities. And just looking at that last row of the table in 2022, that the fishery is 10% less than in 2019, assumes that the commission will go back to an F46 harvest policy in years 2020 and 2021. Um, and I understand why it's presented that way, but another way to perhaps look at this is if the commission wanted to be, for, for example, more conservative over the next three years um, to address the low recruitment time, what does that extra conservativeness do to the probabilities of the fishery decreasing by 10% in 2022? And the flip side of that is if the commission decided to be more aggressive in each of the next three years, what does that do to the probability of seeing a 10% decline? And I was wondering if you've been able to, to run those scenarios, and I guess the scenarios I'd request is uh, looking at F50, which is roughly 4 million pounds less than the current F46, and looking at an F43, which is just a little under 4 million pounds more aggressive. Uh, thank you. So the, the question is, I'm not sure how easy it is to hear. It's actually quite difficult to hear up here. Uh, the question is with regard to the reference level. And so Dan accurately pointed out that the fishery trend section of the decision table is relative to a given harvest policy or management procedure. And it, it represents the probability that you would have to take a decrease in catch to get back on that procedure at some point in the future if you deviated it or if you followed it in the, in the current year. And so as such, it, the whole, the, all the probabilities depend on the reference level that's been s selected. And in this case, it, because that's the, the reference level that we have been using for several years now is an F46%, all of these probabilities are related to F46. And we did get a number of questions um, regarding that, both as a function of discussions that occurred during the Management Strategy Advisory Board, as well as questions that came up after the interim meeting. And so I have actually prepared um, some alternative tables, noting that the rest of the contents of the table don't change. The, the probability of stock decline and, and tr reaching the stock trigger won't, won't change because we're looking at the same levels of mortality. What will change is the probability of going back to a particular reference level. And so again, looking at an alternate table corresponds to looking essentially at a new or an alternative harvest policy or management procedure moving forward rather than just representing a change in the catch limits for 2019 this would be like saying well what if not only were the catch limits changed but the reference level was changed moving forward and so i, I believe you asked for f50 and f50 43 uh yeah that would be fine or you could just i mean looking at the table here you can see that in f49 that last row is a 40% probability the fishery will be 10% less. At the reference F46, it's 53. And if you were to become more aggressive at F44, it goes up to 60. Those are nice round numbers to try and remember. Mm -hmm. So maybe use those. And so if, if we went to an F50, I don't seem to have the keyboard. Yes, 
if I could have slide 140, please. Thank you. This is the, uh, the same table now calculated around a reference level of F50%. And so you can see that the columns haven't changed, but the location of the reference column has changed because now we're comparing back to a different harvest policy. And the probabilities have changed slightly as well. And I, I, don't, I can't remember the other um, table well enough to provide you a point-by-point -point comparison. Uh, but there's a double feedback loop here that I'd like people to think about if they start thinking about looking at alternative tables, which is that not only are you seeing the effect of um, needing to get back to a different level, but you're also starting to see the effect of taking different levels of harvest in the near term. Um, so that, that is the F50 uh, table. And I think we, just to note, <clears throat> I think looking at that reference, it's 2022 is 10% less. It's now a 49% probability. And the F46 reference scenario was a 53. So you've gone from 53% right. of the time, you'd have to take a 10% cut in, in 2022 to 49% of the time. And so uh, if I could have, well, I'll try it myself. And so this is the, the other table you requested, which is the F43 table, which would correspond to um, more in the range of the levels of harvest, fishing intensity that were discussed during the Management Strategy Advisory Board meeting, F42 to F43. And so we, we can make these um, additional slides that I've referenced here available as part of a, a revised presentation to post up so people can compare these, these various numbers. I appreciate that, thank you. Thank you, next up is uh, Paul Clampett with a uh, question about whale depredation. Uh, thank you, Chairman uh, Rydell. Um, I, my, I have a comment. Uh, I was listening to um, the discussion of how you uh, determine whale depredation, and and you mentioned, uh, or the, the lady mentioned that I, I'm sorry, I forgot her name. Uh, that uh, they, saw, I believe, if they saw two lips or two heads or something on the line, then they considered that in a set. A uh, they throw that out. Is that is that correct? I, I can answer that question. Yes, so we have d different criteria for killer whales and sperm whales. For sperm whales, if, this, if there are whales observed during the haul back, even if we can't be sure that they were depredating on the gear, we're not going to use that information because we're concerned that we might not be able to detect the effect of sperm whales. For killer whales, uh, we, we generally see evidence of damage on the fish or on sperm the, whales. I'm sorry. No, for killer whales, we generally see damaged fish or lips back on killer whales. Oh. We recognize that there are occasional circumstances when we would get a single set of lips back even when there are no whales in the area. That does happen on occasion due to snarls and, and other things. So we set the criteria at at least two in order to exclude those cases where there were clearly not whales present, but to capture essentially all cases where we, we were suspicious of whale interaction. Okay. Um, well, I what I'm having a hard time with is this, if, if I'm, if I'm, how many stations are there in area four? I may have to rely on my but it's survey in, it's colleagues. In, is it hundreds, a hundred? At least. And there was 12 that were thrown out? No, I believe we had 1.2% of our stations thrown out in, 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 in the entire survey. Uh, perhaps we could have, uh, Tracy's presentation back up. She actually has a slide with the numbers on it. Well, what I'm concerned and the, about and is that it's, it's, what I'm concerned about is it's being underestimated because uh, there's a reason why so much fish is being taken out of um, St. Matthews area. It's because it's almost impossible to fish in area 4A, 4, 4A, 4D, 4C, D, and E, other than there because of whale depredation. And you have all those stations yet still 1% is relatively few amount of stations being thrown out. And uh, anybody who fishes up there will tell you that if they see a fin, you're not catching any fish. And 
you're, what you're telling me um, makes sense. I mean, I think that's reasonable. Uh, if you see killer whales that you would discount it, but um, the numbers that you threw out seem unreasonably low. And I, I don't understand that. That's, that's a, and, and the problem with that is, of course, is uh, it, it throws the whole survey into question out there. So that's, that's my comment. And um, I think it is in, the stations are in the hundreds, if I'm not mistaken, so. I'll defer to my survey colleagues to perhaps answer this in more detail, but this, they've now put up the, the map. These are all the stations in the entire survey year out of 1,500 stations. These are all the stations where there was any observation of a whale. The red ones are the ones that were determined to have had a whale interaction with the gear leading to an ineffective station. So uh, unlike, I think an important distinction is that unlike the Sablefish survey where they're setting over 40 skates of gear and they just haul regardless of what's happening with the whales. Uh, we're setting a much smaller amount of gear and we're spreading that out on a 10 mile grid. And we, we encourage our skippers to try to avoid whales. So if there are whales in the area, they'll leave the gear and come back later in the day. Uh, they, they may even haul half the gear and buoy off and then come back and haul the, the second half later if, if whales um, show up during the hauling of the gear. So unlike other survey, long line survey activities, we're actually taking action to avoid whale interaction. But in the end, this is, this is the most stringent criteria we could come up with uh, to identify um, potentially sus suspect sets. And we've erred on the side of excluding anything that was even uh, remotely suspected to be influenced by whale depredation. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. That's all the questions that we have from the floor. There were none uh, online this afternoon, but I do have a request from Peggy Parker to make an announcement. Thank you very much. Sorry it took me so long to get here. I just wanted to invite all of the commissioners and everyone in this room to our reception tomorrow night. It will be from 6.30 to 8.30 at the Union Club, which is right across the street. We look forward to seeing you all there. Oh, I said Tuesday? Oh, sorry, Wednesday night. It's after the important reception tomorrow night. Yeah, so as you're filling out your dance card, tomorrow night is the IPHC reception here in the hotel at 7, and then Wednesday night is Hannah's reception, 6.30 across the street at the Union Club. So um, that concludes the questions, I believe, right, Steve? Okay, so um, Dave's going to give us an overview of the agenda for tomorrow, and uh, I'll turn it back over to you, Dave. Thanks, Chair. So we will reconvene here at 9 a.m. tomorrow morning, the Crystal Ballroom, uh, where we will tackle a, a number of additional research-related topics. So we'll hear the report of the Research Advisory Board. And we'll hear an update on the re reports of the Scientific Review Board meetings in 2018. And then we'll dive into the Management Strategy Evaluation Work and the MSAB reports as well. And that'll round us out till lunchtime tomorrow. Uh, at which point we will start to split into the various uh, subsidiary body meetings, the conference board and the processor advisory board. But we'll provide you an update on those uh, at lunchtime tomorrow. In addition, just before lunch tomorrow, we'll actually uh, hear a first reading of the regulatory proposals that are being proposed as well uh, for the Commission's consideration. Uh, and then finally, if you could just bring up the web page for the meeting, um, noting the, the questions and comments regarding the alternative harvest decision tables, we have published two additional information papers. Uh, so if you scroll down to the bottom of the page, they are information papers seven and eight. And uh, they're a collation of information. If you hit refresh, you should be able to pop them up on the screen.
So information paper 07 is, uh, provides additional information on the treatment and effects of uh, Pacific halibut discard mortality, uh, essentially bycatch in the non-directed fisheries projected for 2019. And then more related to the questions you just received, uh, information paper 08 provides those additional harvest decision tables um, which take into consideration an, an, an F SBR of, uh, I think it was 43, 48, and 50. Uh, and they're there for your reference and reading overnight and consideration. Uh, and with that, I'll pass it back to the chair. Thank you. Thanks very much, Dave. Um, so uh, as Dave mentioned, tomorrow there is a presentation from Dr. Hicks um, around the Management Strategy Advisory Board, and we'll also be hearing from the co-chairs uh, as well that will be presenting an update on the work that the MSAB has been doing for the last while. The reason I point this out is that um, today we've heard a lot of questions about the short-term um, uh, results and probabilities and what would happen in the next one, two years. Um, tomorrow you're gonna hear what, uh, and we've been using, uh, what we call an interim management procedure. And you may recall a year ago, we uh, provided direction to the MSAB less than a year ago uh, to focus on the management procedure so that we won't be having an interim management procedure, but uh, we will have a management procedure. And the difference to me is around the long term of how we are managing the stock and not reacting to um, every up and down in the particular stock. And so, I'd like you to think about uh, what uh, that strategy means as far as the long term. And uh, they have a recommendation for us to consider as commission around um, uh, the achievement of conservation goals, but also fish, or excuse me, conservation objectives and uh, fishery objectives. And so I think it's a quite important presentation to hear because we will be making a decision around uh, the recommendation that's come from the MSAB. Would like to have your feedback um, as part of that before we make a decision. So um, that concludes today's uh, presentation. And we start, as you said, Dave at nine, right back in the same room. Um, for the Canadian delegation, I'd ask you to stay behind here in this room. We're going to convene and have a short meeting. And uh, once uh, people are clear, I would ask if you could move out of the room so we could get going. And um, Chris, did you have anything you wanted to announce? Uh, I just, we, I think the Shaughnessy room downstairs has been reserved for a U.S. delegation meeting. Um, we, it, it, I think it, we said 5.30, but at least one of the U.S. commissioners needs a short break. So we're going <laughs> to we're going to start that at 545 downstairs. All right. Thanks very much. We're concluded for this afternoon for the uh, bilateral part. Thanks.
turn this off and draw our particular uh, this year. I just don't know where the cable is. No, it's a projector right here. I think. I know, but that's why I'm always, I'm always dressed up crazy. Like, <laughs> so it goes back and forth. That's chilly. But the one good thing is the heat. The air is moving. Yes. So it's. I know. It's like, well, I've got my, I've got my meeting place. Yeah. Like, yeah. I have this ability to sit right underneath wherever the air yeah. is. So, so it's, you're here for the whole week? Yes. Actually, there's actually meetings. Yeah, yeah. 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 we have two places that wasn't no, good here. No, and this is good, so I'm fine. <laughs> River, John, Ice. Yeah, yeah, said hello I know, to me we as well. do. I, yeah, because yeah. I said, like, we talked to Anne. Nice to meet you. Yeah, yeah, yeah thanks. Nothing. Yeah, I know, I know. Yeah. I think, yeah, go get coffee. Hot. So, Adam, um, I guess I'll find out from Ron. I know. So, so there, there is two different things. I know it's freezing here. Um, so there, there was two things. Uh, Shane was mixing up the frozen head on, the fresh head on. Is that funny? I think we're like, we allow frozen head on from yeah. Michigan. I realize now she's actually talking about fresh. It's about ten thousand pounds. It's not a big deal. I don't know if they ever get it from that point. Like Shane has it. So Shane went through. He gets uh, eleven boats, I think, or maybe just seven boats. Paper chase was five of them, and then others were a boat here, a boat there. It is not a priority. And if Frank, if you have a forty million pound CAT, and you're talking about ten thousand pounds of fish. But this year, why? I, 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 why? I don't know. I mean, not not the U.S. Who cares? No, it wasn't, but it was dual fishing. So it was dual fishing trip, but it was a lot lower quota. Actually, doing an analysis of one of the trips and two trips. For Chase? Yeah. Well, I so tell from the th this was reported in, in Boss as commercial landings from a dual trip. Okay. okay. Uh, so, oh, interesting. But if it was FSC, can they do that? Well, yes, they can, and that's not what they're raising. 